We've got seven o'clock. Uh, I'm Shannon Rutherford, the town planner. This is a town plan and zoning commission meeting for June 12th. I will uh, do a roll call to start us off. Uh, Patrick Carrier. Here. Scott Halstead. Here. Matthew Hutt-Wagner. Here. Liz Sanford. Here. Ina St. James. Here. I will note for the record, regular member Mike Grabulis is absent this evening. And we have alternates, uh, Matthew Bandel. Here. And James Ratcliffe. Here. All right. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome uh, again to Town of Farmington Plan and Zoning Meeting. Today is June 12th. Uh, we're going to go through new business items. We have a couple public, public hearing items and um, the planner's report. Um, we are, so Mike Rebullis is out. Uh, we will definitely uh, need to assign alternates. Are you gentlemen okay if I just assign as we go? That's okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, Scott, do the legal notice, please. Or is there a legal notice? No, because these are all continuations. Right. So we are going right into it. Okay. So this is the new business portion. There's no input from the public. And let's get going. All right. The first is a sign application from Michael Serena uh, at property located at 1024 Farmington Avenue. It's for Claudius. And who do we have? Uh, I believe we have Mike here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Come up to the Come podium. Up. Thank you. Um, I do also just going to make a quick announcement that the second public hearing item 222 Talcott Notch Road will not be discussed this evening. The applicant has requested a continuation. So I'll just make that announcement sporadically throughout so that if yes. anyone calls in or is here, they know that that, uh, that matter will not be discussed this evening. Thank you, Shannon. Okay. Mike, please run up. Hi there. No, I'm to the podium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right up. I <laughs> used to see a computer screen. <laughs> I know, right? All good. Hey, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's a little lost. Sorry. It's okay. And your name and address. Oh, uh, Mike Serena. Uh, Claudia, I'm representing Claudia's Grinder Shop at uh, the new location will be 1024 Farmington Avenue in Farmington. Right. We're almost there. Almost there. Yeah. <laughs> Take that close. All right. All right. And you're here for the sign application. Can That's correct. Tell us what you're doing. Uh, so we have a new sign that's getting brought on the, what, what would you call it? That, that pole that's out there? What's the name for it? Like a sign. Just a sign pole that faces Farmington Avenue. I know there's like 13 different names for it, but yeah, that would be that one right there. So it's a double-sided sign. that will be facing route four. And the other one um, is actually a vinyl overlay on a three panel window. Um, we kind of had a couple issues with trying to find a spot for a sign because of the way the roof is designed. Um, I was kind of told by the sign company it would probably not be the safest bet to put one up there because of how, you know, the way it would work. You'd have to put an L shape on the roof and this and that. If you hang it up here, it could fall. So we decided, what about just covering this window? Because uh, behind that uh, is actually just a on what is this basically just drywall that was never finished so it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing than it would have been if it was just an empty window so um yeah that's pretty much it i just basically did the main one with the claudia's and then on each side is just a picture of a sandwich with no lettering or wording or anything on that just to kind of fill it all up and that's pretty much it so. okay thank you yeah, no problem. we will go through the commissioners for questions mm -hmm. all right mr Matt, so I'm with you. Oh, I was just I was curious for the pictures on the other side here. So, oh, sure. um, so there's there's going to be one main sign in the front of the building, which you just saw in the window. Mm -hmm. Is there two signs on either end of the property? Can you just describe those again for me? Oh yeah, yeah. So on each side of those, we'll oh, actually over oh, here. Good. Sorry, uh, there'll be like a sandwich on each one. Got so it. Um, it was just kind of like something to sort of fill the space. Because uh, I was like, all right, do we do red? Might be too much red. Um, and then if my sign guy said, well, maybe if you put a nice picture of a sandwich, that would be kind of cool. Because I saw it from some deli in Southington. So. And, got it. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Is there any signs, new signs on the road or along? No. Or, okay. Yeah. All right, great. No, no it, it would just be the sign underneath the existing one. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Right. Okay. Good. Patrick. Um, yeah, so those the, the ones on the side windows are going to cover the whole window, correct? Correct, that's, yes. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no questions. No other questions. All right, Scott. Yeah, no questions for me. Thank you. Okay. Liz? Uh, no questions. Thank you. James? No questions. 
and Matthew. No questions. All right. Uh, not about the sign, but uh, when are you opening up? Uh, <laughs> I know it's been taking forever, right? Um, well, let's see. If everything goes well, um, just giving everybody a heads up. So the 24th will be our last day at our current shop. Uh, I actually cut the lease a little earlier. We're supposed to have it until the end of December, but uh, you know, I didn't really have any plans for it because it needs to be redone completely. So I just wanted to made more financially. It wouldn't made any sense to keep it. So uh, if everything goes well, um, we'll be closer about two weeks. So the following week, we'll be moving all the equipment and I'll have the inspections with health uh building is, and i think you guys too might be before that though but then um uh fire and building and all that and then uh the following week is fourth of july so we'll be close for that so if everything goes well i'm thinking july 12th or 13th okay, great fingers crossed <laughs> oh that's awesome all yeah right. it looks really nice in there i think you guys are gonna like it so great and we'll be open a little later too which is nice that's right yeah hours. good and everyone's like why only three o'clock <laughs> <laughs> i'm like trust me i know <laughs> Excellent. So yeah. th thanks again for coming Thank to one of us. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, James, do you want to be a voting member? Sure. <laughs> you want to be? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. teasing you, but I forgot to start with that. All right. Any last minute questions for the applicant? We're good? Okay. All, good. All right. So uh, we need a motion and a second to approve this application as presented. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I make a motion to it. <coughs> Should have cleared my throat first. <laughs> I make a motion to accept the sign application to approve the sign application for Claudia's from Michael Serena of um, for Claudia's at ten twenty four Farmington Avenue. And Second. First. Okay. Everyone know what we're voting on. Mm -hmm. All right. All in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed abstentions. All right. You are all set. Uh, thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Good luck. Thank, you. Bye. thank you again. Shannon, are we super loud or is it just me? <laughs> You're fine. Okay. Okay. You're good. I thought so too. Yeah, it is. It, it is a little bit, but we've had the, re I'd rather have a little loud than we've had the reverse at times in here. So okay. Okay. I go with it. Packed in here for the uh, the last few minutes. You can so. you can sit you can sit a lot, a lot less people breath. to bounce the sound off. Of. Right. Yeah, it's just bouncing off the wall too. So. Oh my <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving right along, uh, Matthew, uh, would you? Um, is it okay with you to be a voting member on this one? All right. Sure. Awesome. All right. So the next is also a sign application uh, for new player in town. I think Farmers Insurance. It's for a property located at. 1825 Farmington Avenue in Unionville. And who do we have? We have Chrissy Brackett of Okay. She's on twice. Mm -hmm. She's online? Yeah. Yeah. Twice. Oh, yeah. twice. Just to... <laughs> okay. Hi, Chris can you guys hear me? There you go. Yep. Hello. 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 Uh -oh. We hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Sorry. I uh, tried calling in, but I don't think it was coming up for you. So hopefully you can hear uh, through my speaker. Uh, we are proposing signage at Farmers Insurance at 1825 Farmington Avenue. Thank you to the commission for hearing this proposed signage application. Uh, this is a corner unit. So we will be proposing a window sign of the logo and uh, name of the agency also hours of operation. Um, and we are also proposing an awning sign, which is just vinyl added to the existing green awnings. Uh, so sorry, just to make that clear, that will be one awning sign on each elevation and one door sign on each elevation. And they're all vinyl. Uh, there is 45 linear feet of frontage and the proposed sign amounts to 35.3 square feet. Uh, also, the vinyl will be mounted on the outside of the glass for the door vinyl. Um, and if you have any other questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go through questions. Um, Matthew, you have any questions? No questions. All right. How about you, James? No questions. Liz? No, looks very nice. All right, Scott? No questions. Patrick? Uh, no questions. And Matt. I'm all set. Thanks. All right. 
So, okay, this is an easy one, pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. All right, is this business in already or? I believe they are open already. Oh. And that's where the cleaners used to be, I think, right? Correct. Yeah, I think Magic Touch, it was called. Awesome, that's good that we have a new tenant. All right, so uh, based on um, no questions, uh, we need a motion and a second, please, to approve this application as presented. Okay, <clears throat> I would like to make a motion to approve the sign application for Farmers Insurance at 1825 Farmington Avenue in Unionville as presented. Second. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, it's unanimous. Thank you for calling in. You are all set. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you too. All right. Um, next one is also an application for signage. Oh, good. For a new restaurant coming to, <laughs> excuse me, 55 Mill Street in Unionville uh, for flavors of Nawab. Nawab? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm going to, I'm very excited about this. Um, all right. James, are you good being a voting member on this one? Yes. All right. And uh, thank you. Who do we have, Shannon? I believe there's Kelly is on the phone. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. Yep. If you can go ahead and explain your application to the commission, please. Sure, um, I'll start with, there is two existing awnings on the building now. Um, we've cleaned them and we're going to paint them black. Um, they're, they're, they are black now, but they're gonna be painted with a fresh coat. And then we are adding white, vinyl onto them with the flavors of Nuab. It's going to be the same copy for both awnings. The size of the awning is 173 inches by 32 inches in height, and there was two of them. The second part of the signage is for a monument sign. Um, it's going to be vinyl placed over the existing sign, monument sign. It's two-sided. It's for, it was the old Panoma, Panoma Peaks location. Um, so it is it is as pictured there. It, the size of that is 40 and a half there. Um, I think we're also replacing with white vinyl the 55 on the top of the, the sign so that it's a little cleaner and brighter. And that's it. Good, thank you. All right, Matt, questions for the applicant? No questions, thank you. Sure, Patrick? Uh, no questions, thank you. Scott? No questions, thank you. Liz? No questions. James? No questions. And Matthew? No questions. <laughs> not related to this sign. Do you know when they're opening up? <laughs> I don't know, I, I know he's anxious. I think he told me he wanted to be open by July 1st. That's why That's he awesome. was wanting to get in on these meetings. <clears throat> okay, that's great. Yeah. Very nice. We have a new restaurant in town or is coming. Great. I do not have questions about the uh, sign proposal either. Um, it looks nice and sharp. Hopefully it will be well attended and supported. All right, commissioners. Uh, we need a motion and a second to approve the sign application as presented. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the sign application for flavors of Nawab. Uh, pardon? It is Nawab. It is Nawab, okay. Um, sign, to uh, approve the sign application for flavors of Nawab at 55 Mill Street in Unionville, as presented. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Okay. It's unanimous. You are all set. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good job. All right. Moving right along. Next one is an application from Ms. Porter's school uh, located at 49 Main Street, also um, at Nine Mountain Road. And this is an application for special permit for daycare use and schedule. And yes, to schedule public hearing with a recommended hearing date of June 26th. Excuse me. So we're uh, accepting this application this evening. Who would like to make a motion to accept the application, please? Okay, Liz Sanford. Um, I'd like to accept the application from Miss Porter School for 49 Main Street, aka 9 Mountain Road, 
to accept the application for a special permit for daycare use and schedule a public hearing with a recommended hearing date of June 26th, 2023. Okay. And do we have a second? <laughs> second. <clears throat> do I actually I need it too? Okay. Uh, James, can I'm you in. be a voting? Okay. Thank you. Jeez, I'm off today. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Opposed? All right. Application has been accepted. All right. The next item uh, from Metro Realty Management. Shannon? Uh, correct, Madam Chair. We're going to uh, delay acceptance of this at the applicant's request. There's some additional information mm -hmm. that's needed in order to complete this application that we've discussed subsequent to the agenda being posted. Okay. So this is just going to get pushed and uh, staff will continue to monitor the time frame for that uh, along with the applicant. Right. So no action needed by There's it. no action on this at all tonight. Correct. Love it. Thank you. All right, now on to our public hearing portion. Um, so thank you for uh, folks that are here, folks that are online. Uh, we do have a um, few public hearings uh, that are being continued uh, from prior meetings. Uh, during public hearings, the applicant gets a chance to present to us. The commissioners have a chance to ask questions, and then we turn it over to the public for your comments, input, and support or opposition of the application or just questions. The first one is um, an application from Carrier Holdings, Inc. Uh, like I said, it's a continuation from May 22nd. It's application for six lot resubdivision of Dominique's Court with waivers and two lot subdivision with waivers of 114 Red Oak Hill Road, R30 zone. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, you're, I'll be recusing myself. All right, so Patrick, you'll step I'll out and then later. Shannon will oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll perfect. Grab Thank you. Finished. Yep. Uh, James and Matthew, you will both be voting members on this one. Okay, sounds good. Great. Why we uh, need 20. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, for the record, Brian Panico with Harry Cole and Son, 876 South Main Street in Plantsville. Um, so you'll remember from our last meeting, uh, this is for a total of eight lot subdivision. So it's gonna be six lots off Dominique's Court, two lots off um, Red Oak Hill Road. Uh, just go through kind of briefly what the changes were um, in discussion uh, from the last meeting. Um, there were some outstanding engineering comments, some concerns about the detention basin and the outlet control structure design. Uh, since that meeting, uh, been working with a staff, uh, in particular Bruce Sear, uh, to try to modify um, how that outlet control structure is going to work and how some of the uh, pond elevations of different um, different berms are going to work to provide both water quality and uh, the best possible uh, decrease in runoff while still meeting all the other regulations. Uh, the applicant, <clears throat> as this was already an, an approved subdivision, had already started the construction of that pond, has already installed an outlet control structure. Uh, so I think in the uh, latest correspondence with Bruce, the recommendation was to kind of see um, if that structure, if we could somehow uh, modify both the pond and that structure um, to work uh, without the applicant having to order a new structure and redo everything. Um, and then there were some additional kind of uh, housekeeping items um, in the report as well that that we will address uh, that we have no objection to. Um, so I think at this time, um, <clears throat> the only changes to be made are kind of those couple of little things with as far as working with staff on how we want to best handle that outlet control structure. Uh, but aside from that, we have no objection to any of the other comments or concerns uh, in working with staff. Shannon, did you have a chance to review with Bruce yet? I, I did. So Bruce and I were reviewing right through the end of last week, um, and then it required us to reconvene uh, this morning with our director of public works, uh, thus the delay in having this come out. Um, and it, yes, the outlet control structure will be modified. So they, the, the comments are, are up on the screen. Um, most of what you're seeing, uh, here is clerical with respect to the subdivision sheet itself. Um, the same for the site development sheet, although, um, you know, they do have to continue to work with Connecticut water in order to have water service. Uh, both the top portion and the bottom portion of the development. So the two 
the six lots that come off of Copper Mine that are known as Dominic's Court and the two lots off of uh, Red Oak Hill Road. Um, and then um, Mr. Sears comments regarding the basin um, in particular, let me see here, the stormwater report. Um, the outlet control structure uh, is shown, the latest calculation shows three 10 inch orifices um, and they just, they do need to coordinate to see if those can actually be cored in in the field or if a new outlet control structure needs to be installed. That's the developer's issue, um, but that was really the final um, item that we had that was of, uh, I'll say a concern, engineering concern that needed to be addressed. Uh, we were able to run that through that with the director of public works this morning. And thus we were able to issue the letter this morning. So with what you just said, you're, and, and the applicant working with you and team, you're satisfied? Uh, correct. So addressing these, there's, I think, 20, 28 comments. Uh, these could be conditions if the commission so chooses. There's no objection to having those okay. as conditions. And the existing home, you're, you're not connecting it to the public utilities, right? So <clears throat> what we were requesting was a waiver for the uh, water to that. Um, it will be connected to sewer. Um, we have done feasibility to show that we can do that. Uh, we know we can also connect water. The question is more or less, will Connecticut water allow us to make that connection or or not? Um, so we're asking for a waiver to not connect in the event that Connecticut water um, does not let us do it. Otherwise, we would have to come back before this commission just to ask for that waiver again, I believe. That would be a fourth waiver then. Correct, because we've got three three waivers that were itemized. We've got the, uh, for the main portion. The road width, yep. The road width and the removal, um, no sidewalk. Correct, uh, no sidewalk on both sides. So that would be, is that one considered one or two? Uh, no sidewalks required for the two. It's, yep. uh, it's once you get up to either four or five okay. lots that the sidewalks required. So the sidewalk waiver doesn't apply to okay. these two. It only applies to Dominique's. So there's the waiver for the roadway width. There's the waiver for sidewalk because it's a six lot subdivision. And then I had a waiver um, for the pavement width here because it, it did not appear that the pavement width was the full. Oh, correct. On the Dominique's court. Well, I think that in our last set of revisions, we did make that wider to what the, the requirement was. We had originally asked for that to be reduced because it's essentially just one uh, driveway. So you could see in this revised plan that Shannon's brought up, that would be what the requirement would be, is 18 feet of pavement, I believe it is, all the way through the 150 foot private road, as opposed to having the 18 feet to where the two driveways had split. Um, and so as you can see, it's 18 feet of pavement, essentially just to one house, it kind of seems over. Um, overdone and just adds to more impervious surface and more stormwater runoff. So that's what we had requested those three for. I, and um, if staff would prefer to forego the waiver for the connection um, on lot eight on the existing house, um, we can do that and we can certainly work with Connecticut Water and hope that they allow for that connection and if not, come back before staff or the commission. But. It was just like commission needs because that needs right. to be itemized because right. the waivers require a five, six vote. So, right. So right now there's four waivers, two for the top portion and two for the bottom. As if I'm understanding things correctly. Correct. That's what we would ask. Okay. And um, this is what happens when we continue meeting. Sorry. Is there a, uh, I know the neighbors, um, surrounding neighbors were concerned about water and uh, blasting. Do we know if you have to blast for the two new ones or you don't know yet? Um, it's unclear. Um, it's likely uh, that there will probably be some additional blasting, uh, particularly uh, in the area of the road uh, as they continue to put the utilities in. Um, we do 
it the site does tend to, does actually drop off in grade uh the further back that you go so a lot of those houses are actually being filled um whether the ledge is deep enough in those couple of sections that it won't interfere with the basement foundations or not is another question um and that's unclear at this time my my guess would be that lot five is likely um, going to be very little uh, blasting just because the amount of fill brought in. Um, lot four, uh, probably on the, depending on where the ledge falls on the garage side, um, it may need some additional blasting as well, but that'll obviously, they'll have to modify their blasting permit and notify different neighbors if necessary and, and kind of go through that process again. Okay. Let me turn it over to the commissioners and please ask away. If there's any confusion, if you need clarification, Matt, I will start with you. Uh, yeah, great. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so this is a little recap for me, right? So we've already approved the four lot division. Correct. Has the work already, you mentioned work has already begun. So work has, has work already been done on that plan? Yes. Okay. Yep. And now you're essentially asking us for to approve two more lots. And there's a lot more engineering to do that. Yeah, so we essentially kind of took that initial design, um, went back through it. Um, from the road perspective, it wasn't a lot. Uh, we basically just extended that road. We did make it wider and did make the right of way wider um, as the regulations uh, required that. Um, and then the detention basin got a little bit larger as well right. um, on the Dominique Scored side. And then we also added another one on the Red Oak Hill side, uh, which takes both stormwater from actually both subdivisions just because of the way that the grades on that site are. Um, <clears throat> so again, when we had done this initially, we had the Dominique's Court subdivision as basically one standalone, um, and that's what you, you guys approved originally. And then we had actually done a, another set of plans for almost a mirror image of that off of the Red Oak Hill side with four lots as well. Right. Um, that was approved by wetlands, um, and in working back and forth with the with Connecticut Water, Connecticut Water didn't like the connection between the two, so we worked with staff and came up with the best outcome of well, if we extend and put two lots here, then we have the existing house and just one additional lot, so it's the same number of lots, just configured in a different way that um, we felt worked uh, a little bit better, and that uh, Connecticut Water would be more admirable too and, and how many lots need to be on well if connecticut water doesn't agree with just the you? one existing house got it so the other yep. the six lots will be on water yeah so currently the water main is shown to come through all of dominique's court so it services all six of those yeah and then we have a, a lateral that runs um off of the cul-de-sac and then through to the uh, other house, the new house on uh, the Red Oak Hill side. Right. Uh, the question that came up, they don't like water mains running through private property anymore. They won't let us let us do that. If you were gonna put a water main in it, it has to remain under pavement. That's what we were told. So by terminating and, and just having a lateral come off, the lateral is then going to the house. So that does that doesn't have to be under pavement so what our proposal originally was was to have two laterals coming off the cul-de-sac one for the red oak the new house and one for the old house again whether or not connecticut water will allow that or not is another is another question from our understanding at this point what we've proposed would be approvable by them um, adding that additional lateral for the existing home is that what's in question and so essentially if we propose it and they say no, then the house is served by the well that already serves it. But I believe that's what we would need a waiver for, correct, Jen, to have that house still be serviced by the well? Correct. Correct. So we're essentially asking for the waiver ahead of time so that if Connecticut water denies it, we don't have to come back and ask you for mm -hmm. another. And, and the, the main water, uh, the water main in the Dominique's court, that's going to all be under sort of public road that's under the uh private road of dominic right. sport yeah right. yep. yep yep okay um <clears throat> so st storm water so in your opinion or your engineering opinion is all the storm water managed on the site 
between the point. two basins yes yep okay and then shannon we the town agrees with that based on the conditions laid out in the document that you pulled up earlier yes okay um no no additional questions thank you scott yes yeah, so i'm going to apologize for this question in advance i'm still trying to follow the waivers yeah so if we could just run through I, sidewalks i've got yep. like the waiver for no sidewalks can can you just run through what the other waivers are i don't know maybe shannon needs to do that so the waiver on the dominique's court side is yep. for the uh pavement width and the um is it the pavement width or the right-of-way width actually That's pavement it. width meets it right, right of way width width. doesn't so the right of way width is required to be uh, 50 feet, I believe it is, unless, uh, you know, or granting a waiver. Um, so once you get to six lots, the right of way width is 50 feet. The roadway width, I believe, is 22 feet. Um, what we had originally done on the uh, previous application, since it was only four lots, um, you're at a, I think it was a 20 foot pavement width and the pavement width is the right of way width. Um, so once you add more lots, that starts to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so again, when we transition from the four to the six, when we bump at that out to a 50 foot right of way, so I think currently we're at 30, we bump that out to a 50 foot right of way, then just pushes your front yards back, which essentially would put all the houses closer to the trail, closer to the neighboring properties, okay. which was the deemed to be less desirable. Um, so we're asking for a waiver to keep that at the 30. And we did actually extend the pavement width um, to meet the requirement. So we do have a small shoulder, though it's not much, but it's all owned and maintained by the HOA regardless. So the Homeowners Association basically owns all of that property anyway. Yep. Okay. And then the second waiver on the other side of the road, yep. the two lot subdivision, uh, requires a 18 foot right of way uh, and an 18 foot pavement width. Um, frontage is required to be 150 feet for lots. So that right of way has to be 150 feet long by 18 feet wide, and it would have to be entirely paved. So even though where the two houses and the two driveways come together, and that would logically be 18 feet. Um, based on where the existing driveway is and where it would connect to this proposed uh, private road, it essentially means that the second hundred feet of that driveway is just serving uh, what is lot seven. Um, so we were asking for a waiver to, instead of having that be 18 feet for the pavement width for the entire length, mm -hmm. since it's only serving one house to go down to, um, we had shown it originally at 10 feet, um, more like a standard standard driveway um so that covers those two waivers and then the water waiver and then the sidewalks okay. was the last waiver. i appreciate you wanting to run through that again absolutely very much. thank you I'm, I'm all set okay this uh that was very helpful thank you for those questions <laughs> yep. just to make sure excuse me um well I, th I think that answered my question thank you okay liz james I don't have anything additional. Okay. And Matthew. Same. No questions. Okay. Um, the two, the, you okay? All right. The Red Oak Hill houses will be similar or so it's the same subdivision, right? So they're going to be similar in style. and. So the existing house will stay right. the same, um, untouched. Uh, the new house will be of similar style. Yep. Okay. To, to the rest of the stuff on the other side of the road. The, and I'm not sure what to do with this, but um, I think I understand why you're here. Uh, we had some good questions in the prior meetings, good questions today. I just, the thing that is a little bit un unsettling is the number of times you've been in front of us and it's good, right? Because we have a process in place, but it's, um, you know, we approved a subdivision and then it comes back with another change and another change. Is, is it because the terrain is difficult? Like, why do you think that's happening? Uh, so it literally is a direct result of the Connecticut water not wanting to provide the service. Um, so if 
we could have brought the water main through and done the four lots on the other side. That would have been before you and about a year and a half ago, and that would have been the end of it. Um, because Connecticut water wouldn't let us do that, um, it basically made it impossible to get water to service um, these, these four lots. Um, so that's why it's coming back. So obviously um, the initial uh, plan before you for the four lots, the developer uh, had a contract on that one parcel of land. That all went through, that all got approved. Um, then the neighbor directly to the south of him approached that same developer and was interested in either selling some of his land or basically doing something of this nature. Um, and instead of, again, instead of trying to go and make changes to that original four lot subdivision, we basically did something different just with that parcel of land. Um, didn't work out. Connecticut Water didn't let us make that connection. And so therefore that's why the modification. Uh, thank you. Yep. Sh Shannon, is that Connecticut Water comes after us typically? Is that uh, cor okay. correct? So typically the uh, through the design process, the engineers will reach out to the utility companies to make sure that service can be provided. So those conversations start somewhat in parallel to the design. Um, and yes, that is the feedback. So the, the issue is that there's water out in Copper Mine Road that can come directly down Dominique's Court. There is not water in Red Oak Hill Road. It would have to come in from New Burton Avenue. Yep. So the length, uh, the the length that that would have to be brought up Red Oak Hill Road, the developer has indicated as cost prohibitive. So thus he preferred to be able to drop it down through Dominique's Court rather than yep. bring it up the couple hundred. I don't know. Is it about 800 feet or 600 feet up? Right yeah, so I think when we had done the calculation, it was a total between going from uh, New Burton Ave, because yeah. it's on the south side of New Burton Ave, so you cross New Burton Ave, come all the way up Red Oak Hill, then turn down the subdivision, it was about 850 feet, 900 feet of water main. Okay, so that was the driving, the driving reason, is an inability to make that run of water main, which is what Connecticut Water had preferred. Yeah. So we have two waivers for Dominique. We have two for two lot subdivision. Correct. I was going to ask a question. Yes, go ahead. So, yep. so Commissioner Halstead's question on waivers um, made me want to ask about, and you touched on this. So what happens to the lots if we deny the sidewalk and deny the pavement? Do the lots just get smaller? Or how, how do I think about that in terms of this development? Yeah, so we would basically... Yeah, so we would basically just go back and re, we'd have to go back and kind of redesign it um, to make the fit, to give it a 50 foot right away, um, add sidewalks into that 50 foot right away, and then stretch all of the lots so they would just be a little more narrow. So basically, less, front, uh, you'd have the same amount of front yard, but less rear yard. Yeah, that's a closer to, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it essentially just pushes all of the houses back. Uh, 10 feet. Yeah. Okay. And that section of copper mine doesn't have sidewalks at this point. Mm -hmm. No. And being it, um, we felt that being it a six lot um, subdivision, that the traffic on that is so, is so minimal that if people did want to walk down that road, it, it's not, um, it's not a through street. It's not a main thoroughfare. They're right. relatively safe. Yeah. We'll but it isn't a requirement, right? So we need to waiver our requirement. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Are we good for questions for now? Um, one other quick question. Sure. I, I noticed um I, I either missed it the last time or uh just spotted it, but the, the endangered species map. Yep. We are in a you are in a part of the hash mark, nothing's there. Uh correct. I think when we had done the uh because this came up on wetlands, I believe it was uh like box turtle. Um was the what came up so the recommendation is to walk the silt fence check for all of check for the turtles pick them up put them on the other side if if you find them that kind of thing okay yep okay thank you okay thank you commissioners and we'll we'll do this again if you have more questions and comments all right this is a public hearing let's uh turn it over to uh, members of the public is there anyone in the room that wishes to speak regarding this application or has questions we're good. Okay. How about online? 
Uh, if anyone's called in for questions regarding the public hearing for Dominique's Court and 114 Red Oak Hill, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom and you will be acknowledged to address the commission. Again, if anyone has called in regarding the subdivision for Dominique's Court, our Red Oak and Red Oak Hill Road, 114 Red Oak, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom and you'll be acknowledged to address the commission. Madam Chair, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Anyone else here? No, we're good. All right, commissioners, before I close the public hearing, questions for the applicant? We're good? good. All right, so at this point, the public hearing is closed on this item. And uh, we need a motion so we can discuss, please. Okay. Do I, if I make the motion, do I need to read each waiver or do I just say as Read the vote separately. Are those, are, are those votes? Oh. When I make a motion, are the waivers vote a separate motion or? They don't have to be. It's our decision. Yes. Oh, okay. We should also include the conditions outlined by In staff engineering. yes yes mm -hmm. absolutely so you could just so nope you don't have to so you can you can put it all together okay initially or or, or you, you can, can break it, it out wait. yeah okay when we may change it right okay so um let's okay uh liz sanford i would like to make a motion let me get my cough out of the way mm. excuse me uh like to approve the application uh by carrier holdings inc uh for a six lot resubdivision of dominique's court with the waivers detailed and a two lot subdivision with waivers of 114 red oak hill road all in an r30 zone and including the, uh, excuse me, the uh, engineering recommendations. Okay. Did I get it all? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Who wants to? Uh, we Second. Do. Thank you, James. All right. Discussion. All right. It's, uh, so we've had this application a few times, as we heard. Uh, it is a little bit confusing. Hopefully, um, with all the questions, you know what we're voting on. Um, Matt, what's your... Uh, feeling about the two and two sure so the, i just I'll, I'll go through my so the six lots right is really four is already approved plus an existing plus one more right that's how in, in my head it works and i think that all you know makes sense to me and what the applicant presented to us i think fits in the guidelines uh, obviously stormwater especially in this area and we hear from residents in this area about stormwater and and based on the conditions from the town staff and right, I think we should put all of those in. Um, that sounds seems to me to be managed on site. Um, the pavement waiver I'm fine with. Um, the I don't know if we're doing the Connecticut water one or not, but again that one it would come back to us. It sounds like anyway or or not. I'm fine with that one as well. Definitely. You know the sidewalks one. I think principally say no. I think sidewalks are good for a community. And they enhance the community, enhance the neighborhood. I live in a neighborhood with sidewalks. So again, I think I'm a no on that one. So you see, you, you think we should break it up by waivers, the vote? Is that uh, what I'm hearing? Yeah, if, if that's if that's um if that's how the commission would like to go with those, otherwise, yep. Okay. Anything else? You're good. That's it. Okay. How about you, Scott? I, I, I'm in a similar place. I think um, the description of the waivers helped, and I think a lot of them make sense. I'm I'm always torn with sidewalks because every every new development is not connected. You got to start the sidewalk somewhere, and we always say, "Well, there's no sidewalks anywhere else to connect into, so we're not going to do sidewalks." And so I, I understand what Matt's saying and his concerns there, but I think the rest, with the town being satisfied with the the detention basins and how that's going to work. Um, the only thing that's really questionable in my head against the sidewalks. Okay. That's fair. Thank you. Liz? 
Uh, I I understand most of the, I understand the waivers. Um, I definitely like the fact that if if we do the waiver for the narrower driveway, that will lessen the amount of impervious surface, and I think that's a good move since stormwater runoff is a is a potential issue. Um, sidewalks, mm, I'm a huge sidewalk uh, proponent. I walk everywhere in this town and I love having a sidewalk, but I also find this to be a smaller area. And I think it is a tough call, but I would, I think I would prefer to not have the houses pushed that much further back. I just see that might be more of a potential problem with the <clears throat> the trail and the neighbors. So, uh, but I I am a huge sidewalk proponent. So, a little divided. Okay, James. Um, I mean, the plan itself uh, not a huge departure from what has already been approved. Um, you know, so yeah, Matt had pointed that out a little bit earlier. Um, I could go either way on the sidewalks. I, I, um, I don't have sidewalks where I, I live. Um, it's a, um, I, I, you know, I'm walking on the road all the time in some quiet parts of the neighborhood. Um, the fact that it doesn't connect to, um, uh, copper mine. Um, yeah, I don't know if it would be like more of like, kind of like stick out, um, a little bit more. Um, I think there would be plenty of space to walk around and stuff like that. So I could go either way and, I, you know, we can talk about that at, at some point, but um, everything else I'm good with. But yeah, not a huge departure from where we were at when we originally approved it. And my biggest concern was stormwater. It seems like that's all been. Hashed out with the touchdown. Okay. Yeah. All right. Matthew. Uh, everyone has great points. Um, I don't think that the sidewalks are, are a necessity. I do think that this neighborhood is very walkable without the sidewalks and still being safe. Um, as everyone mentioned, stormwater has been addressed and with the staff's recommendations that will you know, be adhered to. Um, so I, I'm not really uh, feeling the need to you know, single out the sidewalks. Um, I think that's where I stand. Okay, everything else you're comfortable with mm -hmm. as presented, okay. Um, I think the location of the subdivision being right along the bike trail, um, I I too feel like the sidewalks. And I don't know; it's too it's more pavement than we need. But um, we're kind of uh, three quarters, either or, and then you might I don't know. Would you feel comfortable voting the way it was um, structured? Or can I, go ahead. Can I ask Shannon a, qu a clarification sure. question on site? So. The regulation, how many lots in Farmington do you need to sort of trigger uh, sidewalks? I'm sorry to put you on the spot here, but I'm just that's okay. like, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting to like, what's in the regulations and we have, right. We've talked about having these regulations for a reason. That's right. I'm, I'm smiling because I had it open and then I closed it. So, <laughs> um, so the subdivision regulation um, in section Four, it's table two, discusses lots right away with and sidewalk requirement. So right through five lots, no sidewalks are required. It's when you get up to six lots, it's uh, it, it jumps from six to 20 lots and sidewalks are required. So that's, we're right on that threshold. Mm -hmm. Got it. And one of them is an existing house, I guess. I mean, this is a perfect number, Matt, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's, no, it's good to know. Um, listen, I think I, I like some, I like Commissioner Hollis's point. Like, sidewalks got to start somewhere. <laughs> I mean, what, am I going to vote no for the whole subdivision because of that for essentially five new lots? I, I, I don't think so. So, we'll find if we just want to keep keep it together at this point. Um, Shannon, clarifying question: While you have that <laughs> sidewalk <laughs> regulation, I know we have moved to. Is it? Am I correct in saying that all new sidewalks need to be four feet wide? Is that correct? Or I I believe our town requirement is five foot sidewalk. Five foot. Okay. Correct. I knew it had been mm -hmm. bumped out in but, certain areas, but correct. I thought it was okay. Five feet. So that's five feet closer to the trail. If yeah. you want to think about it like right. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm good. I'm you know, I, I'm yeah. I'm good with the sidewalk waiver at this point. So the motion and second stays? 
Yes. Sounds like it. Yeah, with all the waivers, right? Okay. Yep. That's what. Mm -hmm. All right. And the yep. conditions. And the and conditions. The yes. Waiver. The right. conditions of the engineering. Yep. All right. So, um, so we have a motion. We have a second. Good discussion. Are we ready to vote? Yep. Okay. Yep. Right. All in favor of this uh, carrier holding ink application? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think that was unanimous. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ryan is in the front. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And you will talk to Shannon. Yes. Yeah. And it was very, very nice meeting you. Seriously. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next you item. Patrick, back in. The next oh, yeah. Patrick. Shannon. I'll go, I'll go grab right. Patrick. So, uh, Calc. Yeah. Well, it's just going to be oh, it's table. Just anyone, it's anyone. Okay. Do we need a motion for that? Or does it continue? Yes, go ahead. No, no problem. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'll be two places at once, Jen. Okay. Thank you. The new guy is back. I'm back. I wasn't here long. <laughs> All right. I'm getting too comfortable. Yeah. yeah. All right. Public hearing. Uh, the second <laughs> item is an application, uh, again, continued from May uh, from Calco Construction. And uh, this application is being continued. Shannon? Yes, please. June 26 is okay? Yes, For now? Please. Okay. For now, yes. So we need a motion and a second, please, to continue. Okay. Uh, make like to make a motion to... Um, continue Calco Construction's application for six lot subdivision of 222 Talcott Notch Road with waivers R80 zone and continue it until June 26, 2023. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And, and that's all. Are we just need to. Aye. Yeah. Who is James. 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 Okay. Yeah. James. Yeah. Okay. He's <laughs> all over it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, all right, the uh, last public hearing item in front of us is uh, an application from Bulwark LLC. Um, and uh, James, you want to continue? Sure. All right, we'll have James continue. It's, okay. uh, Madam Chair, just yes. point of clarification. Mr. Carrier, have you reviewed the record regarding uh, uh, this application? Did you? I have, yes. You did? Yep. Okay. That's, all right. Thank you for uh, looking out for us. All right, so this item is a continuation also. It's an application for change of zone and a uh, special permit and site plan approval for self-storage facility. Welcome back. Good evening, Madam Chairperson, members of the commission. My name is Robin Pearson. I'm an attorney with the firm of Alter and Pearson in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And I appear this evening on behalf of the applicant, Bulwark LLC, and I'm pleased to be here. And hopefully we'll be able to show you that we've responded to all your comments and you'll feel comfortable making a positive decision on this application. So with that, I'd like to let you know uh, and reintroduce our, our team. Uh, here this evening on behalf of Bulwark LLC is Matt Morris, one of the owners. <clears throat> Dave Pulley was here last time, Matt's here this time. And in terms of our presentation team, David Zayex and Scott Hesketh on Zoom, should be of the, are here to go from FHA Hesketh and Associates, our civil engineer and our traffic engineer. Uh, Donald Jones is here by Zoom, and he is with Donald Jones Consulting, and he will be the operator of this facility if it is approved and has extensive experience in the area of um, self storage facilities across the country. Um, with us again this evening is Mark Dean, who is the architect. Uh, he's with um, Dean Architecture, and uh, he too has much experience with uh, self-storage facility design. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a quick recap um, just to make sure we recall where we were on this. Um, Dave Zayax will then talk about the revisions that have been made to the site plan, landscaping plan. Um, and some responsive information um, since our last evening together. And he's also going to talk a little bit about why, again, for you, this uh, development is particularly suitable 
for this site and not necessarily for other types of commercial developments. Um, Don Jones, again, I mentioned is our consultant our, our on uh, the operation of the facility. And he's going to talk about the need for climate controlled self storage in this area um, and also the benefits that it provides for Farmington and frankly, some area communities as well. Mark Dean will go quickly through the revised architecture. Um, you have a slightly, you have a changed elevation in front of you this evening. Um, and I believe that's been responsive to your comments and staff comments. And Scott Hesketh is again, as I said here by Zoom, should you have any traffic questions for him? But we did go through the traffic issues at the um, last session. Um, I'm going to just make some concluding remarks as to why I think this is in compliance with your plan of conservation and development and the criteria that you have to consider when you decide whether or not to approve the zone change and, um, and special permit. Um, I'll start with a quick overview as, as we believe we left matters with you at our last session. There are, of course, two applications before you, the zone change from R80 to the commercial zone C1, also a, um, a special permit application with site plan for self-storage under the warehouse use category, which would allow that with, uh, as a use within the C1 zone. So uh, as you're aware, we have uh, a number of units, 400 plus self-storage units in a four-story climate controlled facility. I wanna underscore for you again that we did spend a lot of time in front of the Inland Wetland Agency and that review, two reviews in fact, had significant implications for how this design ended up the way it is. And it's important, and you know that, that you do have to take into consideration the wetland um, decision when you make a final decision on a special permit. Um, you may or may not remember that we went through two applications before the Inland Wetland Agency. Uh, our first application was denied. Can you go to just... Uh, You've got it, Shannon. Can you go to go if you would go to the next photograph, the next slide, which is the revised one, and then I think the next next one after that. Well, next one after that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, it's a large site. It's approximately five acres in total. I think you can see the outline of the entire five acre site. Only about half of this site is currently proposed for development. Um, we went to wetlands with a self-storage plan that would include development on both sides of this large piece of land. And on the, I'll get my bearings, on the westerly side, it was going to be one story um, self-storage units. And on the easterly side, where we're currently developing or proposing to, to develop, it was going to be three stories of self-storage. Um, the comp the square footage was comparable. It was just that it was laid out across much of the site. Um, Inland Wetlands made it clear to us that they were not going to approve that, and they did not. They said specifically that um, they did not want to see development on the westerly side of the site. And they said, look, we're giving you a prudent and feasible alternative to your plan, and that is, make the development a four-story development on the easterly side of the site, in addition to some other things they wish to see us do. So we did that, we uh, reapplied, and based on their instructions, all the development is on the easterly side in a four-story location, and they approved it on March 1st of this year. And however, they, were adamant that the conservation restriction that was on the east side had to be extended over the entire west side of the development so that there would be absolutely no chance for any future development on this site. Um, we kicked a little bit, uh, but we didn't get very far. 
And that was a condition of approval and we've met it. And that's why this design is the way it is. And I bring that to your attention, both because I know it's something that you're gonna consider their, their direction um, when you take this matter up, but also that explains why, because I know height was an issue for you in terms of its appropriateness for this area. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But um, I just wanted to underscore again that a lot of time <laughs> went into um, getting everything over onto the east side of the site. And it has some very positives for the town going forward. It uh, restricts the amount of incursion into undeveloped area. And it makes sure that for futures, for future use, if this application is approved, there will be no development on that west side of the site. Um, <clears throat> And it's not all wetlands over there. It's not that it couldn't have been developed. It was just that this was something they wanted and this is what they ended up with. So to uh, just remind you of the development that does exist in this area on the south side of Colt Highway is, uh, those are all, those properties are commercially developed. On the westerly side is the excavation site that Tilcon has. The zone is EE, that's called uh, Earth Excavation Zone. That's Colt Highway number 222. Uh, next to that, going to the east, is um, a C1 zone, same zone as we are proposing this be rezoned to. And that is a uh, landscaping um, entity. The address is 223 Colt Highway, and it's Cumberland and Cole, I believe is the name of the facility, but it is a commercial facility at that location. Then further to the right of your screen and uh, to the, that would be to the east, is the tractor retail facility. That's not a C1 zone, it's a B1 zone, but it is commercial and business in nature. Um, all good reasons why rezoning our parcel from R80, which is a single family development uh, uh, category. And certainly I think it's fair to say a location that's highly unlikely to see someone wanting to come in and develop single family homes at that location in the future. Um, but we believe based on the uses that are in the area, that this is certainly a, an application that makes sense for you to consider favorably. On the northerly side above our site, the uh, R80 zone is on the westerly side. That's undeveloped. It's single family. I do believe the owner, one of the representatives of that facility, of that property was here at our last hearing and had no objections, but it is, it is zoned R80. Next to that, moving towards the right is a town-owned land also develop, uh, also zoned R80. And then further to the right is um, uh, also town-owned land in the PR zone. And up in the corner, you can see the beginning of the complex that comprises the Hampton, Hampton Inns and 299 Colt Highway, um, both fairly sizable developments in the area. Your plan of conservation and development specifically says on the future land use plan that this site should be rezoned and used for commercial. So we believe this proposal before you tonight will leave the town with an attractive and extremely low intensive commercial use, which will uh, meet a real need in the community and is um, specifically responsive because self-storage is typically used by people in residences that it'll also be responsive, particularly to the need, residential needs of the community and area, um, potentially area towns as well. So it's also a use that is definitely of interest and handles the need where people move, downsize, move into a community, into multifamily developments. Um, there's often a desire to have a place to be able to store your um, your prized possessions, things you care about. And this is a high-end self-storage facility. It's all climate controlled. So that's sort of different from some others you might 
have had experience with, which are not at all. And one might not want to put one's grand piano in there or antiques or paintings or anything like that. Tupperware, yes, but other things, maybe not. So it, this is a distinctive kind of self-storage facility. Um, I'd like to sort of paraphrase what I think your concerns were. Uh, you told us that we needed to work on the height issue and we have reduced the height to make sure that it complies with the C1 maximum standard of 40 feet. Uh, in response to uh, the comments as to whether this height is comparable with the height of other uses in the area, you do have um, a staff report which looked at, I, I'd say it's fair to say, comparatively tall um, developments to the Northeast, specifically the Hampton Inn uh, hotel facility is 36.2 feet in height and 299 Colt Highway apartments are 39 feet in height. Um, Colt Highway apartments are three stories, but the height itself is 39.2 feet or 39 feet, I'm sorry. So at 40 feet, I would say, say it's fair to say that we are comparably sized in terms of height. Across the street is different, but in terms of whether this is acceptable or appropriate or harmonious in this part of town, we feel strongly that it is. Um, you also asked us for an, an exterior treatment that might be more typical of Farmington. Um, at the same time, you did acknowledge that the commercial uses across the street are, I guess I could say, pretty rugged in appearance. They're not, you know, um, well, we'll leave it at that. In any event, uh, we did take that into consideration and we toned down the appearance of the building and we added a, um, a brick course, uh, real brick across the uh, the the bottom of the building, which our architect will go through to really anchor it and and give it some substance and relate it to um, other aspects of Farmington's development, which does use a lot of of brick. You had questions about the driveway access, which I believe we answered. I don't have anything new to add to that, or our team does not. But as I said, Scott Hesk is, is here. Um, the sight lines are compliant. We've underscored that this is a low traffic generator. If you're gonna have a commercial zone here, this is a great use um, that will really have subdued um, traffic generation. And ultimately DOT has jurisdiction over this because it is Colt Highway. And of course, if you have any concerns, you should share it with DOT. Um, we're in that process. We can't tell you um, whether it'll be approved, but we assume um, there should be no issues with being able to get through um, our DOT re review. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Zykes just to go through the specifics of the changes that we've made, and uh, I'll circle back at the end. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the commission. My name is Dave Zykes. I'm a professional engineer with F.A. Hesketh Associates. We're located over in East Granby, and um, Robin did a good job in uh, summarizing where uh, where we are, but I just wanted to go over a couple of uh, my own comments. Uh, there were some uh, um, staff comments uh, that we received last time, and also we listened very carefully to uh, the comments from the commission. And um, really, for as far as the changes, um, well, I, I did want to give you some numbers on that that issue of the conservation easement, just just in case somebody had some. Questions regarding the actual numbers. The site is uh, 4.99 acres, and uh, the conservation area actually turned out to be 3.58 acres. And so that's uh, this development is uh, sitting on 1.41 acres of the uh, the overall property, and the and the conservation easement actually. Uh, I guess my pointer is not going to work on this screen, but the conservation uh, area actually wraps around the facility on all three sides, the highway being on the, obviously on the south side. So uh, as Robin pointed out, um, as far as any expansion of this facility or an addition of some other use on the property, that's not going to be uh, really possible to do that in the future. Um, looking at the um, the layout sheet that, that we uh, have in the set, um, which is up on the uh, 
the screen right now. Uh, a couple of th things I wanted to point out was that we uh, we added a mountable concrete curb to the east driveway. Remember, the east driveway is right turn out only. Uh, the main driveway in the center of the site is the, is the principal uh, access to the property. Everything is clockwise around the building when you leave. Somebody could actually go out the main driveway if you went to the office and didn't uh, didn't go to your storage units um, and uh, needed to leave, you could do that. Instead of going around the building, you would be able to go out that driveway, but I don't see too many people doing that. Uh, the principal um, circulation is around the building and you will leave uh, at that easterly driveway, uh, which is exit only and right turn only. But uh, the staff wanted to see us uh, put a mountable concrete curb there as well. Uh, that would uh, further prohibit people from making a left-hand turn out of there. And we're working with a DOT on the final design of that. We'll review it with staff uh, once uh, once DOT is okay with that. It's pretty typical. I did point out to the staff that uh, I do, I've done about five of those in a row, and every design is different. The DOT can't seem to make up their minds exactly what they want that to look like, So, um, but we will have one there. Uh, with the landscaping, and as far as the uh, the other changes to the layout plan, uh, if you recall, we discussed the uh, HVAC units for the building. They will not be on the roof. They will be on the ground. And uh, there's only three locations for them. One tucked way up in the northeast corner of the building uh, in the back. And then over on the northwest side of the building where Shannon's spinning the uh, pointer right now, there's two locations up near the dumpster locations up there. So you'll see, you really won't be able to see these units from Route 6. And we added to the landscaping plan on that easterly side, we added some buffer plantings just to add some additional buffer. I don't think you'll be able to see them anyhow, but uh, there's some additional buffer plantings there. And then along the foundation wall on the front, I think there was a comment maybe from one of the commission members. Um, could we add some additional foundation plantings across there as well? And we've done that in the landscaping plan. So you'll see that between that, one story brick facade now that's there on the first floor and then the additional um, foundation plantings. I think you're gonna have a really attractive face to this building looking down on uh, Route 6. Um, so that's really it as far as the changes to the plans. There were a number of the labeling changes and things that staff had, but nothing that would really uh, cause any layout changes to the, uh, to the plans. Um, as uh, Robin pointed out, uh, we have, I think the, there's a physical practical limitation to this property in addition to the conservation area. And that is, I think we discussed it last time, is there's very limited areas uh, on this property to install a full, certainly a full size septic system. So our, our needs are very, very small. We're going to have uh, so bathrooms on the site for our, our one permanent uh, employee that will be here when the site, when the facility's open. And then uh, if customers are here and they need to go to the bathroom, they'll be able to go. But uh, the amount of sewage generation from that is very small. So that works. Anything bigger, you know, if you were thinking, well, what are the other uses you could put on the property? You know, certainly not a restaurant or anything like that. You would never, never succeed in getting a septic system for those types of uses on this property. And then, of course, we have the traffic situation on Route 6. We think we have a safe driveway design. But on the other hand, we have a very, very small volume of traffic using this. Again, something that was a high traffic generator probably wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be appropriate here. So uh, we feel that the, the the use that we're proposing is is really a good fit for this property. Um, we have practically no sewage generation and very small amount of traffic, as Scott pointed out. Scott Heskett pointed out in his traffic report to you. Um, as we talked about it last time too, is that we we have an application uh, before uh, DOT uh, for uh, what will eventually become a driveway permit. And that we meet the uh, the driveway uh, sightline standards um, in both directions. We've done a full analysis of that and provided that to staff. And um, and as far as the uh, I think the circulation the way we have it and with the left hand turn, uh, a right hand turn only on the on the east driveway. I think that's a really good design and the sightline is very good at that location. Looking back, you can see all the way back to the Hampton Inn traffic light at that location. It's just in the right spot on the curve. So all in all, I think we have a good safe design. We've made some changes. Uh, you had a really good landscaping plan. Um, and I think you're gonna be pleased. I hope you're gonna be pleased with the changes to the architecture to go along. And if you have any other technical questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them.
uh, Donald, uh, who is in the virtual world, is going to do some um, presentation on the uh, market analysis. Are you there, Donald? I see him down in the right-hand corner. But there he is. Um, I, I hope he's not driving. Yeah. Uh, mm -mm. Uh -oh. Can you hear me or no? Yes. I'm not driving. No. Can you can you hear me or no? no? Okay. Very good. I'm not driving. I'm sitting in a parking lot. So, but I appreciate everybody taking the time this evening. Um, what I'm sharing today will not take very long. Uh, but what I wanted to share with you is since our last presentation, um, there's been three individuals uh, on our team who have each gone back to the market just to try to true up the question: Is there too much product? Uh, self-storage in the area now. Um, without going into a lot of numbers, I would share with you that within three miles of the sub, uh, of the subject site, we have roughly 55,000 population there. Uh, based on industry standards, we're short somewhere between 165,000 and 275,000 square feet of self-storage, which would be the equivalent of somewhere between two and four properties. Um, this particular property, Sometimes we look at the gross size, which is uh, 79,200 is what's being proposed. And we say, well, that's too big. Um, just as a reminder, we don't get to use uh, every inch of those building, that building for storage because we have hallways, offices, uh, stairwells, and elevators, uh, plus vestibules for people to use to move in and out. So we anticipate we're only gonna get about 50 to 55,000 rentable square feet of storage. And again, based on the numbers that uh, three independent individuals all ran, again, we believe there's uh, a substantial amount of uh, product that's missing in the market. Again, somewhere between 165 and 270 plus thousand square feet. Um, there's always questions too about why do we need the storage? And so I think what I wanted to do is kind of close up a little bit and just share some of the whys. Um, so we have people moving around the country all the time. Sometimes they need to move into an apartment in your particular case while they wait for a house to be built. So they'll use self-storage. Sometimes they already live in an apartment and because of winter and summer conditions, they take uh, their winter clothes and they'll storm when the summer comes up and vice versa. Uh, we have people who enjoy the holidays very much and they'll have a lot of stuff that they wanna store, but they can't get rid of it, And uh, but they, they have it. And it's not because they're gluttonous, is because they just enjoy holidays and they, they store their things. Doctors, lawyers uh, all use self-storage uh, for their offices. Um, I don't know if you know it, but pharmaceutical reps aren't allowed to store, aren't allowed to store their products uh, in their home. They're required to have a self-storage, is required to be climate control, uh, is kind of, kind of required to be secure, and they're only allowed to store uh, a certain number of uh, products that they take out, so they use that as well. Uh, um, I think there was made mention the other day uh, about uh, one of your group who uses self-storage personally. Um, we have our parents who age and uh, when they pass away uh, through, through uh, our, our own personal senses, we decide to store their things and we always say we're going to get back to it. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, college students come back and forth all the time. That's what they do. Uh, teachers who are in school and they're required to remove their items at the end of the school year and store them until the next school year, um, they use self-storage. Um, and I can keep going on and on, but storage isn't just about the, the aforementioned word uh, gluttonous. It's because we have needs and your particular community has needs and the, uh, the math uh, uh, relates to those needs. Um, this is an incredibly good project. Um, you have a lot of people who have put a lot of their effort, their professional knowledge into this, trying to give you the absolute best product we possibly can. You can see on the map that they're illustrating that we have a couple of extra spaces in the market. We have a U-Haul. We have a couple of live storages in the market. These are all uh, REIT. They're very high-powered uh, locations. What they do is they, they have their metrics that they're required to operate off of throughout the country. Uh, Location doesn't matter to them. They use their exact same metrics no matter where they are. Um, and that's true for all of those locations. 
This particular location, if we were to come in to manage that, we would be managing it not as a REIT, but as an individual with the same um, personal influence and personal uh, integrity that your your owners who, who are coming in to try to buy this property, which would be Matt and Dave. Uh, they've spent a lot of time on this, trying to make it exactly what they want is this is their home, no different than it's your home. And they have a ver very personal uh, feeling about what this could do for your community. And that's why they've put forth the extra effort and put forth a great team to do that. So. If I may ask a question of my own. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I heard you say it, but in the information that staff put together, it looks like these facilities, the ones that were noted in the staff inventory, are uh, where there is an occupancy rate. It's quite high. And I don't know, in your experience, can you just give one or two um, assessments of what the current market looks like? Are, are these things doing well? Are there a lot of vacancies or are, for instance, I know there's one you looked at in West Hartford, and I don't know if you know anything about that, which happens to be climate controlled and is very similar to this and is four stories also. Do you happen to have any idea of what the status of that is? I know they're building it out now. We have a, a uh, there's a brand new uh, facility, uh, which is out actually, um, I think that the blue ring on here represents a five mile radius. So I wanna be, uh, I wanna help you with two things. The orange line represents one mile, green line represents three, five line represents, uh, or the, the blue line represents five miles. Within this market, the 55,000 population is related to within three miles, your, your green ring. When you go out to the blue ring, we're talking about somewhere around 150,000 people. And so the, the number is so high, it becomes irrelevant. The property immediately to your right, the extra space is right there, was recently built. The uh, Right now, there's two things happening. The occupancy is growing faster than what their pro projections were. And the income that they have projected is, is much higher than they had projected. Normally, these are set up on a three-year lease up. This one they anticipate being full in 18 months. So it's leasing up twice as fast as what they thought. The other facilities that we checked, the extra space that's within a three mile radius, uh, just to the right of the uh, highway I-84. I that location uh, is a large facility, multi-story, 100% occupied, or I don't wanna say 100%, nothing's 100%, but well north of 90%. And, uh, and again, it's doing very well. Uh, every facility that we marked, um, is at 90% or greater, which is that's where we want to actually operate. We want to be able to tell customers, yes, we have something. We want to be able to provide that to them, but we don't like to tell customers no. And so everybody's operating kind of where they belong uh, based on the numbers, again, that we ran. Uh, some of them are assumptions. Some of them are through facts based on our conversations with the operating owners, um, but they are at 90% or better uh, across the board. There was one in Avon that uh, Extra Space recently purchased. I don't remember where it is on the map. That particular facility in Avon was 100% occupied for the better part of seven years straight and Extra Space came and bought them, so. Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted to put on the record that, A, there is a need that's clear and, um, but there's so much need, you know, you coming into the market isn't going to change that. There's still going to be a need to be met by this. And even if this is approved, um, that need will still exist. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Uh, good evening. My name is Mark Dean. I'm principal at Dean Architects. Uh, my office is in uh, Depew, New York. So when we were here last time, um, I think I gave you a, a brief overview of the building. And just as a reminder, um, the building is uh, approximately 79,200 square foot. And that's, uh, as Donald mentioned, that's gross square foot. It actually has a net rentable area of uh, 56,000 square feet. Uh, it's a four-story structure. On the first floor, there's a small office. Uh, 
two loading areas, two elevators, and there's stairs at each end of the building that chew up some of that uh, gross square foot. Uh, the additional floors obviously don't have the office. They don't have the loading area, so they're dedicated solely to uh, storage units. And there's a total number of 463 storage units in the facility, ranging from 5 by 5, 25 square feet to uh, 10 by 25, 250 <coughs> square feet. And it's divided equally among different sizes uh, throughout that range. The majority of the, the, uh, the discussion was uh, regarding the uh, exterior aesthetic, both the uh, building height um, and uh, I believe the overall aesthetic of the project. So we went back and took a look at the exterior. If we could pan down to uh, the renderings. Do you want to start with the original? And yeah, we'll, we'll start with the original. So this, is the, this was the first one we presented. Um, and uh, so that building, that main roof, even though it averaged under 40, that main roof was what was above 40, was about 42, 43 feet uh, at that front entrance. Again, it averaged under 40. Um, we had some bright yellow doors. We had some colors that, <clears throat> that uh, weren't, uh, weren't re well received. Um, so from there, we, we toned down the exterior a little bit. We removed some of the windows, we toned down the doors, but we kept those sort of architectural features of the higher roofs at the corners and in the center. And so if we go down to the next one, uh, this is what we have put together since this last meeting and uh, what we're proposing tonight. We brought back the windows in the corners. Um, we kept the uh, toned down color version of a sort of a neutral gray. But I think more importantly, we pulled down the roofs at the corner of the building and at the center of the building. And this does one of a number of things. First of all, the maximum height of the building in front is 40 feet. And that's that tallest roof edge that you see. The building slopes to the back uh, by about 30 inches. So our average roof height now is uh, below 39 feet. Um, and our maximum height is 40 feet. In addition to bringing those roofs down, it helps sort of break the building into a smaller scale. It presents the building as a three-story building based on that center entrance piece, based on the corner pieces. Uh, in addition to that, we added um, that uh, a full floor, full height of, uh, of brick to the exterior. The brick uh, brings in uh, is responsive to some of the aesthetic in this area. Um, and uh, it helps bring it back to uh, what we see in other buildings uh, throughout this region. Uh, but also, it, it helps bring the scale of the building down. Again, by breaking up that brick as a, on a full story, it helps visually reduce the building, I think, almost from a three-story or from a four-story to a three-story, the way it's configured now. Um, we've, we've done a lot to scale the aesthetic of the building down so that it doesn't present itself as a big, solid four-story wall. Uh, we added a large fascia to uh, the, the, uh, the roof line of the building. I don't know if that's something that you can zoom in on or not, but uh, not, not a big deal. But we added a large fascia. It's a detailed fascia. It's stepped in. And again, this, this is an aesthetic that we see in this region, um, a nice heavy fascia with a little bit of a detail to it. Uh, and, and again, overall, we broke up the elevation into smaller pieces, smaller components. So first floor component, we've reduced the, four, the fourth floor window, so it now appears to read as a three-story structure. We retook the four-story roofs off and pulled those down to be equivalent to uh, what we see on most of the three-story buildings. So I think that was really the majority of what we did to help bring this back to a more comfortable scale um, and more presentable that as you drive by, you don't see a big four-story building. It really presents itself more as a three-story building. There's no question on the roof. 
uh, elevation now based on the fact that our maximum height and I and I just the small caveat is there is an elevator penthouse in the back, but that doesn't count towards our our, our roof average. Um, that elevator penthouse in the back that you won't see from the road is 42 feet. And it's just a six by nine area. Um, but other than that, we've done um, sort of tremendous strides to help shrink the building down uh, physically and uh, aesthetically. Okay. Um, I have just some findings I would like to make in terms of compliance with your regulations, but if you would prefer to go to staff, I'm sorry, to comments or questions first, that's up to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I took a look at the standards that you're supposed to consider under Section 12 um, with regard to the granting of a change of zone or special permit. And uh, there are seven of them. I'll quickly go through them. One and two are I consider together. They say that the existing future character of the neighborhood in which the zone and or use is to be located will be protected and that adequate safeguards have been taken to protect adjacent property and the neighborhood in general from detriment. I'd like to point out for you that the uh, commercial character is already established by what's happening on the south side of Colt Highway across from this property. Um, your plan of conservation and development does designate this on the future land use map as appropriate for com commercial development. Uh, the property to the north of our site is uh, town owned in two instances and um, you now have a wetland requirement if this is approved that the whole western side of this site cannot be developed and must re be in a conservation easement. If this is approved, of course, that conservation easement will be um, uh, filed on the land records. And then finally, that this development, we do believe we've made the case that it's an extremely low intensity development in terms of its use and therefore its impact on the neighborhood. Uh, items three and four talk about that traffic circulation within the site and the amount and location and access to parking is adequate and the road network has to um, accommodate what's being proposed. And I would just say that we've made the case that the internal circulation works, our driveways work and have been improved with the additional mountable curb that's now been added. DOT has uh, ultimately jurisdiction over this, and we do believe that the, uh, you know, in and out is achievable given the capacity of Colt Highway as a roadway. Uh, items, item five says that the basic design of the proposed use or building and its overall physical appearance must be in general harmony with the character of the surrounding neighborhood and will not serve to blight or detract from abutting residences or other property. And uh, I think we've made the case that this is now a well-designed building, uh, feels appropriate. The height is definitely comparable to, but if not, it's certainly not of, out of harmony with the taller developments in the nearby area, including um, 299 Colt Highway and the Hampton Inn. Um, and I'd like to just point out that we've been through, this is our third hearing. We had two hearings before Inland Wetlands when these plans were um, being proposed. Um, we had, we've had one night of public hearing already here. There has been no opposition to this development from the public. So it's not of a concern to the public, which is something, you know, you are the ones that decide this application, um, but there are not issues that others are, have raised that have been brought forward to you. Uh, item six, where the application proposes increased building density, over that permitted under the existing zone. And I would say this large building would be allowed under C1, but not allowed under R80. Um, we have to, you have to be able to find that uh, this increased development can be accommodated without a detrimental impact and that adequate safeguards have been taken to protect the natural environment. And going back to things we've already talked about, the conservation restriction certainly does that to a great degree. The fact that there's town owned land undeveloped to the north does that to a great degree also. Um, Finally, item seven, that all required public services will be readily available to serve the proposed development, and the answer is yes. 
Uh, you can attach any conditions you feel are necessary to um, the, not to the zone change, but to the special permit application. And I just like to leave uh, two other, three other comments as you consider that, uh, this application, and that's the plan of conservation and development does ID this as commercial. There's no requirement, which I think is interesting, that in your own regs that says compliance with the POCD is something that you should consider, but we've pointed out that it does comply. And that um, certainly the C1 zone is appropriate given C1 right across the street. And uh, I think also something for you to consider that we've pointed out now also is that if you want to develop this for commercial, and your plan of conservation suggests that you should want to do that. Um, this is probably one of the few types of development that would work on this site. And a lot of that is because of the constraints. We now know that only part of that site can be developed, but also that it would be very difficult to have a higher intensity commercial development on that site, if only because you're not going to be able to serve it by septic. Um, the site design complies with C1 zoning, as does the uh, height of the building now. And finally, I do believe that we've satisfied the staff comments that have been raised. We've worked with staff through this process. Uh, you have engineering comments, and uh, Mr. Sears indicated that, that uh, certainly his remaining concerns were minor and they could be addressed through changes to the plan. And I do believe that um, planning staff also had nothing outstanding in terms of concerns. So with that, we hope you can approve both the change of zone and the site plan special permit. And we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You ready? Go. You're ready? I'm ready. Yeah, that's, <laughs> all right, Matt. All right. Well, first, thank you so much for taking another look at the design and seeing how it fits into Farmington, right? And thinking about our town and what sort of surrounds this area. So I appreciate that. So I just got a couple uh, different questions. So the, the, the building height, just to confirm that for me. So the maximum height is 40 feet. And we've been provided drawings that sort of prove that out. Is that is that fair to say? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, so just a question on architecture. I appreciate the brick part of it. I was just curious, is the blue and the yellow, is that somehow attached to this brand of storage? You Is it, right, like U-Haul, you can kind of sense it's like orange, right? You know, why the blue? Like, why, why choose this type of color in this area of Farmington? Can we go back to the rendering? Yeah. Um, why not two levels of brick or three levels of brick? And again, just the thought process on the design of the building. Well, I'm going to definitely turn this over because it's <laughs> not my proposal between Mark and uh, and Matt um, to answer that question. Great, thank you. Yep, Mark Dean, uh, Dean Architects. So the blue is is definitely a branding color. Okay. Um, and uh, to to bring the brick up higher didn't make a, a lot of sense to me as we started putting these together. Uh, the the sort of neutral gray color and the blue band are a uh, metal panel, at it, but it's an insulated metal panel that's three inches thick of uh, foam insulation. So we have a very high R value uh, with that material, as opposed to the brick we have to add. We have to do a composite wall behind that uh, and put insulation inside the wall. So not to mention the cost of the brick itself um, makes it a little bit more prohibitive to take it up. Mm -hmm. When you go up to a certain height, you have to put relief angles in in order to carry the weight of the brick. So it, it really became sort of on a constructability end. It was a good point to, um, to stop the brick at. Got it. Great. Thanks. And, and Mark, while you're there. So the elevators, how do I think about the elevators? Are they passenger elevators or sort of large? So they're, they're what's called a, uh, a service elevator. Okay. It's, yeah. uh, it's in a passenger elevator range. Uh, it functions like a passenger elevator. They're ADA compliant. Uh, anybody can use them, but they're just more heavily rated and a little bit larger cab size. Uh, so they're rated where standard elevator you get on in a hotel is 
maybe 2,500, 3,000 pounds. Right. These elevators are rated at 5,000 pounds. Right. And the cab typical for a storage facility. Typical of, for storage. Okay. And of this nature. The cab, the cab dimension is again, a little bit larger. It's about five and a half feet by eight feet. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and just last one, I, I don't know for who this is for, but the building, the distance to the front, this is the farthest back the building can go. Is that fair to say? You can't push it back any further from the road? Right. Okay. Right. In order to get the driveway all the way around the building to get access for <clears throat> uh, the patrons and for uh, fire access, uh, you really mm -hmm. can't push it back any Got further. It. Well, and I would just like to say we're constrained by wetlands. Yep. Understood. Understood. Just wanted to ask. And uh, just two more for me, quick commissioners. So just to confirm the use, a lot of storage facilities rent out trucks, rent trailers, sell us uh, uh, moving materials, moving boxes. So there, there is any be, of that going to happen? Will there be people there, coming and going to purchase items outside moving, of storage, storing their yeah, stuff? There'll be moving boxes within the, within that rental office, uh, but uh, I don't think there's going to be any truck uh, truck rental or anything on, on this property. Okay. Um. My last one, just on signs. I drove up and down this road a bunch over the weekend. Um, it's it's tricky, and I I think it's just the the way um, the site is. But when you take a right out of there, the only way to get back to eighty four is to do a U turn into another business, unless you have the patience to go all the way down into town and then go into Plainville. So it's tricky because I mean you don't control when people leave your site. I don't know if there's a way to Put a sign that says "Do not no U-turn on Cole Highway" or something because it is. It, I don't know what the signage looks like when people are taking a right, but again, unless you have that patience, the the only way you're you're just taking a U-turn in one of those business. So again, this isn't a high sort of traffic area, but I don't know from a site plan perspective if there's anything that could be done with the flow <laughs> to prevent that because it's it people are going to do. I did every time you drive down, you're going to Turn back around. You're going to go to five corners, and you're going to go to 84. That's going to happen every time people leave this site because that's the quickest way to the highway. So I, I don't know if you could think about the site plan or if you thought through that or any additional signage to prevent people from doing that because it's just going to happen, and people are going to have trailers or bigger trucks. So <clears throat> yeah, we did. Oh, excuse me, uh, Dave Zayax with the uh, FA Hesketh. We um. We definitely have to take that in consideration every time we have these turn restriction driveways. They'll be heavily signed as the staff require or request that we, we're going to have mountable curb in there uh, really force you to make that right-hand turn. And yes, there is a little bit of inconvenience with it, but we're faced with that more and more on, on our commercial sites where we have a lot of times right turn in, right turn out. That's all you get. And, I, uh, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, just, just throw, the reality. I, like a question, is it better for people to take a left from the site than have them do a U-turn off-site on another business? And is there a way for your site and you to manage that on from your customers and, versus having another business now deal with your customers making a U-turn on another business? I mean, you know, we we felt that it, the safest condition was to was the restricted driveway to right. Could we convince the DOT to let us go with a full driveway to make a left? Uh, we have the sight line. We meet all the technical requirements. So if the committee, maybe if the commission felt strongly about that in your discussions, we could entertain that. But as of right now, I'm, you know, our feeling is the the right hand turnout is is the quote unquote safest operation. But you know. Um, no, it's it's probably the safest looking at this site, but I'm just right. thinking for the town. Right. And that section of town, like if I was the DOT, all the cars are gonna go and make a U-turn. Like it just I did it ten times like that. Like you're just gonna do it. So again, again, I don't have an answer on what, what yeah. that should be. You know, it's good the common sense, like you're 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 approaching it that way. We've I've I have personally argued with people that in particular at the district office, the DOT. The same thing, you know. Why, why, why is that? And their attitude is that's 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 not their concern, you know. But is, we're, there, we're is there a site plan so you can manage again your customers taking that left? Well, we have we've done everything physically that you know norm, using the, the normal design standards with a very severe right turn, 
proper signage, things of that nature. Um, so the design meets that type of meets the standards for that type of restricted driveway. But then you then you could overlay the a practical discussion on top of all the technicals, you know, safety discussion. You know, um, like I said, uh, we have no personal uh, uh, problem with with people being able to make a left hand turn out of there, but it's been our experience with DOT that they're they're going to probably balk at that. And, uh, um, you know, we, I, I, I don't know, you guys could talk about it amongst yourselves, whether or not you want to go down that path during your deliberations with special permit this to at least, um, have us approach, approach DOT to have that discussion. But I would, I would ask you not to restrict it that way because we will probably would fail with DOT to, to make it a full service driveway. I'll just ask one more. Do you think it will fail because they'll want you to put in a traffic light? Oh, we would never qualify for a traffic light. Yeah. Okay. Using the warrant system, there's there's no way we would ever get a traffic light either at either driveway. <clears throat> so we would be just it would just be a driveway. And uh again, whether or not they would accept the left hand turn out of there. I wish I had a more definitive answer for you, to be honest with you. It's a it's it's a it's a challenge and, uh, uh, you know, a situation that we face many times. David, if I can jump in here for a second. Yeah, why uh, don't you go ahead, Scott? Yeah, the way the site's laid out, for emergency access and for trucks exiting, we felt the right turn out was most appropriate. Uh, I'm not as concerned with passenger vehicles making a left-hand turn out of the site, but uh, we're thinking about people who are renting a U-Haul truck or have a vehicle with a trailer on it and trying to exit onto Route 6 across, you know, two lanes of traffic uh, was not, in our minds, a, a great thing to do. So we thought, at least for the one access driveway, to have them making a right-hand turn out. If someone is coming from the east and looking to depart toward the east, um, they could certainly park in one of the spaces out front, access their particular unit, if they're going to pick up one or two items, uh, and they could certainly exit out the the main driveway and, and do that. Um, if they're unloading, if it's if it's something that they they visit the site frequently, they would know that and and, and do it. If they come to the site once or twice a year to unload lots of items or switch out their spring clothes for their winter clothes, as as we've heard uh, earlier, uh, it'll just be something they'll have to plan to do and 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 approach the site in one direction and exit the site in in another direction and or they'll pick another uh self storage facility where they can get to it and make the movements that they need to um but as you've heard there's uh you know there's a need for this type of storage facility and uh we think that these units are going to fill up and people will just have to plan appropriately and and make the movements that they they need to make uh um, and, and plan accordingly. So, could I just add one other point? And it, I was reminded of it when Scott was talking. I mean, the intensity of use again is not going to generate a lot of traffic out of this site. So, even if only a certain number of that small number decides that they want to take that aggressive U turn, it's still very de minimis. Um, so I just put that out there also. It's not a high generator of traffic. Can I, a, a quick follow-up. So do you have any sort of data on the frequency of people who come and go uh, or these storage facilities, right? Like if you, this owner owns a bunch in the country, do 50 people come and go on a Saturday, 110? Because that, that would help us think about the traffic flow, right? If it's 50 cars yeah. coming and making that U-turn on a Saturday we versus five. Scott, why don't you um, take that question because I know it's in your traffic study. Number of people coming into the facility on a daily basis. Right. Certainly, yeah. Running the uh, the IT numbers based on the size of the development and the, the number of potential units, we're looking at somewhere between 90 and 115 trips a day and that's a trip is a two-way item so it'd be 45 people a day to the 53 people a day 
I expect that that's mostly during times when um, we're ramping up the facility. Um, peak hour volumes are in the range of six to 13 trips in an hour, you know, with half of those entering and half of those exiting. So we're looking at low volumes of traffic uh, on a regular and uh, recurring basis. Um, and again, as uh, as indicated, not all people would need to make a, you know, come from the east and, and depart to the east. Um, if, if we're looking at 50% coming and departing to the west, and you're looking at maybe 25 vehicles a day, perhaps, which would have the um, desire to make a U-turn. But then again, if if someone is um, plans it accordingly, they could stop by the facility on their way home from work, and they happen to be passing in one direction. So even though they live in one area, they may or work in one area, they can they plan their trip accordingly, and because they know that about the turn restrictions and, and won't have to do it. So we're somewhere in the range of perhaps maybe twenty a day, which would maybe desire to make that particular movement. So twenty a day might make that U turn U turn I was describing. Potentially. Okay. Thank you. I'm good, and that's thank you. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, the only question I have was, was the uh, the windows. Is that strictly aesthetics? What's the uh, the purpose of the the windows? Is that to break up the building? Is that well, it does a couple of things for us. It does break up the building, but it. Um... It, it presents the building to the public as a self-storage facility. It's a show window. The doors behind it are, are fake doors. They're faux doors. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it presents people driving by that this is a self-storage facility. Okay. I was just curious. That's my only question. Okay. How about you, Scott? Uh, no questions from me. Thanks. And Liz. Uh, my one question is the term mountable curb. Could you explain that? I'm just not familiar with that. Um, you see them a lot, excuse, again, Dave Zayax, you see them a lot on these uh, restricted driveways. Basically, it would allow a, an emergency vehicle like your fire truck or something to make that turn without having to make the sharp right-hand turn if, for them to leave. Um, uh, and if there's an emergency situation, you can you could make a left-hand turn out by going over the top of that. I wouldn't recommend doing it with your normal car, but uh, you can do that. I understand the concern. I mean, we 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 struggle with this. You you know them in, on your Route Fours, your Route Sixes, all through towns. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always this constant give and take with, especially when the DOT is involved. You know what's appropriate: right turn in, right turn out. They they tend to like these right turn in, right right turn out onlys, and uh, they have no sympathy for uh, the comment that was brought up. Or well, what about the people who need to go the other way? Well, they'll say, well, they'll just have to find a way to go the other way. It's it's, it's one of those things that we just deal with, you know. So, thank you. Okay, yeah, I just didn't quite understand what you meant, but it's it's a curb to get you to turn the right direction. It's an island. It's an island. It's, okay. It's driving. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's, That's it. all you have. Okay. How about you, James? No questions for me. All right, and Matthew. Uh, no questions for me. These are easy on that side. Okay. <laughs> Um, Shannon, have all the hard are the, all the hard ones you have down there. <laughs> it's all good. Got it. Noted. <laughs> Noted. Uh, Shannon, have we received calls regarding this application? I have calls. I'm not coming. Not really. No, not okay. that we're aware of. So, um, what? Uh, let's see. I don't know who provided this document. I apologize, but there's a document that was shared on storage, self storage comparisons, and I don't know if this is a good interpretation or not, but uh, it seems to me that Farmington is not at 100% based on the information here. I don't know if I can take it further and say, well, maybe Farmington is satisfied with what we have. So who's going to use this huge facility? Probably people from surrounding towns, right? Um, I'm still worried about this uh, location. Uh, I won't disclose how fast I was going today, uh, <laughs> but and it's a two, you know, I was going back home off the highway and uh, it was rough. Um, and I can't even imagine if I needed to slow down and pull into this facility. Um, but maybe I'm a nervous driver. I don't know. Um, so I, that's where I'm going with that. But uh, the, the, 
what happens? So we have this uh, business and hopefully it succeeds. Let's say it gets approved. Uh, what happens if the environment changes? We don't have need for storage. I don't know. Maybe there's an AI solution for all of our junk. But what happens if we have this building that has no septic really? It's like, who else could occupy this facility? Like when we look at um, our commercial. If you don't mind me answering that, I'd be glad to. Uh, so again, I've been in the business for 29 years. Um, conversely, uh, Kmart leaves and they have a big box uh, or any other big box retailer. They leave and they leave you with an eyesore. Um, self storage has been one of the best uses for those big boxes. Um, U-Haul did that um, within your geographic region. I don't know what it looks like, but I think they tried to do a pretty good job. But but you uh, but self storage typically goes into those big boxes. Uh, I can tell you in the 29 years I've had experience, I've never ever seen one of these units like this type of facility uh, ever be vacant. Um, so even at 70, 80 percent occupied, it still has more value than to letting it go. So I don't suspect you'll ever see this not become self storage. Sure, I, I get the spirit of what you're saying, but it's a royal pain to get to. The traffic is horrible. I cannot pull out of it. Okay, yes, only uh, you know, I'm only making several trips a year. I don't know. Like, remember my husband? He loves to check in on his storage unit. I just um, that that that's where my head is. We're a small town of twenty five thousand people. We don't have big box stores, uh, and uh, based on the information, again, I don't know who pulled it together. We're not close to capacity with what we have. So that was that. Yes. I'm assuming you're referring to the sheet that's up. Yes, there. yes, yes. Yep. So town staff pulled that together. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diggle did yep. the research at, uh, at my request so that we had comparison information. Okay. Um, I was also looking at uh, the other storage units that have, you know, the 500, 600, uh, the large storage units. Uh, they, I think they're in different parts of towns and cities, uh, like the one in Avon, all you see from the road are rooftops. Uh, I think that's the closest uh, climate controlled storage unit. Um, I don't know. I'm not convinced. I guess is where I'm going with this. I think it looks great and the applicant has done a great job uh, making it look even better. But between the need, the location of it, that side of Route 6, I wish we could put it on opposite side of Route 6. I know it's a, <clears throat> I don't mean to be funny, but I think it, it would belong better on the other side of the road. So I have no specific questions. I'm just <laughs> going on and on, but uh, just kind of sharing my thoughts. Um, I think the information, uh, I don't have additional questions regarding um, what has been presented. Any, go ahead. Yeah, um, so just listening to what you were saying, like when I think about this, um, I think we approved uh, what, a thousand apartments, mm -hmm. right? And every time we approve an apartment, I wonder like where, you know, where do they put their stuff? Like my own house, I feel like I can't, I can't stop building more storage <laughs> and I, and I get rid of stuff too. So uh, my initial thought is that this is something that will be rented um, because of the apartments that are coming online. Um, they, they have stuff, right. And then they don't always want to throw it away or they might be moving to somewhere bigger or whatever. So mm -hmm. the demand I would think is there. Um, and that's just, just because of the thousand apartments mm -hmm. that we have and, and the popularity of that product. So those are. No, those that, are no that's good. Thoughts. And we'll I'm sure get into it more with that uh, in the discussion right yeah, yeah. section, but thank you for sharing that. That's fair. Before we open it up, any more questions for the applicant? Uh, just one, actually. Okay. It's a two-part question. Um, the average tenant, how far are they coming to get to this facility? Okay. Um, three, minutes. three minutes. 
three miles. Three That's miles. what uh, the so, architect. So your ring went out to five. I believe the inner ring was was two miles. One three five. I think. So the average would be somebody within that range. Okay. Average. So there would be others that would come. And remember, this is climate controlled, mm -hmm. so it's a specific type of unit. Okay. So those rings there would be the green ring. Green ring. Yes, that's right. Okay. And uh, on on tenancy rate, uh, what's industry standard for a successful storage venture? Obviously, you want one hundred percent, but what would be considered a successful storage unit? Either Donald or I can answer that. But Go ahead. I mean, to, to be to run a successful business, you only need to be about seventy percent, seventy two percent. Um, to obviously the higher the number, the more successful you are. If you go back to that slide, um, I, I think there's there's more proof of need than than there isn't on that slide because when you look at these numbers, ninety six percent, ninety nine percent, ninety one percent. There's only one that's eighty percent. Uh, the rest of them are over ninety percent full. That means that they have maybe ten units left. Uh, at most, uh, for all of those units, they're at 96 to 97 or 99 percent full. Um, so I think sort of opposite of what you're saying, that this chart really demonstrates the need for this area. Correct. Thank you, Mark. I was going to say the same thing. All the evidence points to the fact that these are very much in demand. And uh, certainly the ones that the staff was able to get information on show that they're basically full. So there is demand. And I mean, to state the obvious, my client wouldn't be looking to make this sizable investment um, unless they thought this was going to be a very successful use. Uh, I'd like, unless there are other questions, I'd also like to address um, your comment about accessing the site. Remember, any use there, anything, is still going to be faced with whatever constraints you felt right. left you uncomfortable on the roadway. It's still good. Pardon me, David, do you want to add to that? Um, just in uh, Dave Zayax, just uh, in reference to the, the chairwoman's uh, comment is that I understand your concern. You know, if you go out there today uh, and you're driving along, you're like, well, this is interesting. You know, how how is this going to be a safe access point here? Well, I, I I felt the same way when when my clients first approached us for this. I said uh, that route part of Route Six. I don't know about that. Let me go out and take a look at. It. So, you know, I I've got it in my head how it's going to look when we're done, not with the way it looks now. So it is very intimidating to drive along there, and and look at you know all the heavy vegetation now and you know some of the rock outcropping kind of things around. But visualize what it's going to look like in, when we're done. We're going to have two well-established driveways. Everything's going to be landscaped there. The building will be there. So that whole feeling of, you know, well, where's how, how are we getting in and out of this thing? How can we see anything? That's all going to be taken care of with the site work. So it's going to have a whole different feeling to it when, when you're done with it. One other interesting thing about it is when you're traveling sort of westbound on Route 6, heading towards Bristol, uh, the, the sight line is actually affected by the curve there as well with, with the, because of the vegetation and everything. So uh, you're a bit surprised. The, the sight line is going to improve for those folks too. As they're, as they're going around that big curve, they'll be able to see much better people coming from the other direction. So it's all going to change a lot. So you, yeah. you have to have a little, I don't want to call it a sense of imagination, but you have to like, you know, Think about it in that regards, not what it looks like now, but what it's going to look like when we're done with all the, you know, the second point. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. I did have one more question that just came up. <clears throat> the uh, artistic rendering um, shows beautiful blue sky behind, it, but there's, we've got retaining wall. And what will be, as we talk about ledge and rock and outcroppings is, and the retaining walls in the back, from this point of view, will that be seen? I guess will will there be a backdrop of of rock? How high up is that from the oh. site? Because we're looking directly down on it on all our on all our maps. We're yeah, looking so this way, and I'm just curious to know what we'd look if we went looked around. Mm -hmm. The site, on average, slopes towards the back. Identify so, yourself, Mark. Mark Dean and Dean Architects, and. Um, so really what you see from the rendering 
I need, I do need you up to the microphones though, so that we can capture the uh, recording, please. Thank you. So the site, it slopes to the back. So the retaining wall that's in the back is gonna be fairly low grade. You may not even see it, if, even if the building wasn't there. But the only thing you're gonna see, if we go back to the rendering, I mean, the rendering is true to the site plan, okay. the way the curve is being shown, the landscaping that's being shown. Um, and you'll you'll see a little bit to the left. I don't think it's, it's unfortunately, it's not in the rendering, but you will see a little bit of the wall on the left, but as it wraps around to the back of the building, there's gonna be really no view of it at all uh, from the road. So even though it is an artistic rendering and it, and it is that, uh, what you see is is really very close to what you're gonna get. Okay, thank you. I also have one last one. Just this, is, to, why, just this a, is why we have this. Go ahead. No, this, uh, this spreadsheet too is just talking about tenancy and things like that. Um, and the, the, there's four units um, or four facilities in Farmington, three of which are exterior, one's interior. Would the exterior ones be non-climate controlled is yeah. it, typically? All right, so there would be only one of competition basically in town. Right. That's climate controlled. Would that be a fair assessment? Yes. Okay, I'm good. And for the record, if you heard that, Mr. Dean was saying, yes, that's the case. I'm good, thanks. Are we okay for now? We can come back, all right. So, um, Hello again, uh, this is a public hearing. If there's anyone in here that wishes to speak in favor or opposition of this application or has questions, come on up, please. Please state your name and your address, thank you. My name is John Galvin. I live at uh, 12 Cutler Lane. I uh, also am a commercial real estate appraiser and have the MAI designation. And I've been praising for over 30 years and specialize in special purpose property types. And my office is in my office condo, which I own at 16 Spring Lane. But I also own the self-storage facility uh, at 610 New Britain Avenue, Rue Storage. Mm -hmm. And I also own 18 Granger Lane. And I used to own what is trackside storage now over in Plainville. And I've appraised many of the self-storage facilities in this area over the years. So I am here in opposition to this, but I commend them for a beautiful design and hiring an excellent attorney. <laughs> um, but I, but I, as, I, as a, a, I just want to start out as a, as a resident, I just think it's too intensive a use. I never thought this was going to get through uh, wetlands. And I kind of feel like I'm standing on the railroad tracks and the train is about to hit me by coming up here and speaking. But uh, it, it's kind of like the Walmart coming into town and knocking us out is what it really is. Um, I just think it's too intensive a use for the site. I know we want to have more commercial to reduce our taxes in town, et cetera. I do work for the town too in that respect. But I also think that safety-wise, it's just, it's an issue. If you've ever pulled out of Farmers and Valley equipment or out of the, you know, I've done it with my dump truck and it's like playing Frogger sometimes trying to get out there. And we've had have accidents out there over the years too. Um, from the, uh, from a, uh, the competition part of it, I think if you go back to that chart, you'll see that both A1 and myself, we have the ability to expand, but we haven't expanded over the years because it's not feasible. We haven't been able to raise our rents that much, only in line with operating expenses. And the reason is, is because of the increased competition that's come on the market. Uh, I bought my facility in 2009 out of foreclosure, and it was 20% occupied when I bought it. They paid $1.2 million to build it. I bought it for 420000 The town, when it was built, the planning and zoning made that the developer, developer build it with um, aesthetic split face block for construction, made them put a berm out in front and made them hide it because they didn't, they didn't want the facility at that time. The facility that I bought and sold over on uh, Neal Court, I bought that out of foreclosure too in 1989. It was 10% occupied. Granger Lane I also bought was distressed from the property owner. My point is these are not recession proof as much as the people come out and all the statistics and everything that's going on they are not recession proof as a matter of fact i've been appraising now for over 30 years but i started out at a bank and at one time self-storage was considered an undesirable loan at the bank and the reason is because they do get beat up now this particular facility does have a climate control 
A1 has climate control. He's never been able to rent out his climate control at any more than his regular units. And his climate control has mostly been vacant. I don't know about the facility on that, um, on New Britain Avenue, the new one that was approved on the corner of New Britain Avenue and, and before. I knew I do know uh, Jim Calciano, and I do know that when he got it approved, uh, the, the primary approval was the bank and the Fed. And they also, when they approved that, they didn't think they were going to be able to lease it up. I know they're still struggling the last time, and they have put laterals, sewer and water laterals, in when they developed that, thinking that they're going to have to go back to retail at some point. So that question I thought was very good because that building has an alternative use. It can be due for a uh, for thing. Uh, for something else if something goes on. But I think you got to understand that the cell storage business is built in layers, as it's been indicated. You know, you have your hoarders, you have your contractors, you have your people moving in and out, as it was said, that buy houses and come and go. And you have these different layers. And, uh, and you have guys that use it for man caves. You have your people from your apartments that keep their, you know, patio furniture in it and stuff like that. You, and that, is a, that is a big part of it. But the market for a self-storage facility, which I disagree with, with what the regional statistics show, because it's very common for the REITs to do that, is pretty much your zip code and your fringe of your surrounding zip code. And if you look at our occupancy rate and everybody's occupancy rate, that's pretty much what it is. We don't get anybody from West Hartford. Avon self-storage was sold to a REIT, which was built up, and the man did a great job running that. I've appraised it a couple of times. His primary customers were not just coming from Avon, they were coming from West Hartford, which was an underutilized market. It was an underdeveloped market. And they've been expanding over in that market to capture that. We don't really have anybody to come down from Avon in our facilities. We have a couple that come in from Burlington, no one really further. We have a couple that come in from Bristol because they feel like it's a little safer than what's over there. But we really don't have anybody coming from New Britain anymore or from um, or West Hartford anymore or anything like that. And, and the primary reason is if you look at the market, um, in the past you know, seven, 10 years, we've had 600 units go over in Bristol. Southington expanded with 600 units. In New Britain, we had, we had Connecticut self-storage expand in Plainville. We had U-Haul put up by the GE building, which is, I think they're approved for 1,200 units. They still have a lot more that they can put up. That's inside, not just the outside units. The Walmart and the uh, Shaw's building in, in New Britain both have been converted to inside self-storage. And now the Shaw's building is up for sale because they're struggling to get that occupied. We're just oversaturated. We've had new uh, out in uh, New Hartford that's been built up. And then another facility further out in New Hartford in the old Waring building, that's been struggling to lease up. So we just, it's, we're not a market that actually has a demand for this. And those statistics are up there, the 97 I'll argue with those all day long. One of the tricks in the trade is when you call us and ask us if we have any units available, we all say, yeah, we have a few units. Because if we tell you how many units you're going to have, we're going to have somebody say, well, I'll give you a lower fee. And then it just starts driving down the, the rate, rates. And um, it's, it's, so it's a trick in the trade that everybody tells you they don't have as much available as they really do. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can go talk to Dave Gardner, our, your assessor, and look at our I&E statements, which are based on our tax return, you can figure out what our occupancy rate, true occupancy rate has been. As far as the traffic coming in and out of the facility, we only have 120 units over here in Farmington and we're probably around 40, 50, 60 cars a day coming and going. Um, it, it is a, it, we get more people in the morning and a lot of people at night and on the weekends, it can get it quite hectic over there. Um, but we also rent to the different sports leagues in town and stuff like that in order to keep our place Occupied, we do we do reduce the rents for some of the people too. I probably on tape and shouldn't be saying that, but uh, <laughs> but I'd be happy to answer any questions. But the primary thing is, I just think this is an over improvement for the site. I mean, I can totally understand um, them wanting to be there. I can totally understand the logistics of coming in from out of the state or understand someone's from California and looking at this market and saying it makes sense demographically. But you got to remember that people always forget. I mean, look at the Berlin Turnpike. The Berlin Turnpike, we have national retailers constantly going in and out of there because they come in and they look at the regional statistics and they think it makes sense, but they forget that people don't go over the mountain to go to places. I mean, how many of you have actually traveled to Bristol to go shopping? We tend to go north. I mean, it, it's just how we, we are around here. Um, so I, I think this is just a, an over-improvement for the site. I am opposed of it. 
And if I didn't get up here and say something and it does get built, I'm probably going to be kicking myself in the tail because <laughs> they're going to have to cannibalize from us. And one of the problems we have with the regionals, I did a, I did a, a three hour lecture for the Connecticut Assessors Association on the self storage industry. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that happens in the industry is you have your REITs, you have your regionals, and then you have your mom and pops. And one of the problems is when they come in the market, they offer deals, they offer all these incentives, and they basically cannibalize from other people. And that's what's, what happens. And then we end up with an oversaturated market. And what happens if our occupancy drops any further, what happens then to the community? We got to come in and we got to file a tax appeal because we can't afford to pay the taxes and set price. So it kind of dwindles down. So you may be gaining one way, but you're going to lose elsewhere. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you might have. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else that wishes to speak that's in the room regarding this application? We're good. Okay. How about online, Shannon? Do we have anyone? Okay. If anyone has called in online uh, to offer comment on the Bulwark self-storage application, please raise your hand using the feature in Zoom and you will be acknowledged to address the commission. Again, if anyone's called in to offer comment on the Bulwark self-storage application on Route 6, please raise your hands using the feature in Zoom and you'll be acknowledged to address the commission. Madam Chair, there are no hands raised. Okay. All right, commissioners, any final questions for the applicant? Are we comfortable closing the hearing? Yes. Okay. So. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Um, it would have been, I, I wish we'd had your concerns, you know, that we could have given a little more thought to before trying to address them before you. As a land use attorney, I have to point out the obvious, which may not win any points for us. Uh, but competition is not a consideration. It never has been. And it's certainly not something that you look at in terms of um, the standards of review. That's a harsh thing to say. It's not necessarily a good thing to say in terms of trying to bring an application home. But all of the evidence that we have got and which our client is basing this application on indicates there is a real need and that this is going to be a very nice facility. Might it impact some other businesses in terms of uh, people wanting to be there in a climate controlled facility and a new one, a new facility? Yes, that's certainly a possibility. But it, there is all the research that we have done, and I believe what you can see looking at the chart, um, we accept those numbers and the experience we have because we know some operators in the area and we've talked to them one-on-one -on -one who would not be in this same exact area. Um, you know, they have, they've said, for instance, that West Hartford project, it's going gangbusters right now. Um, there are, there is a need, the evidence supports that, and it doesn't indicate that it would be robbing from one person for another to be able to go forward. Now, this is an argument you, I know you hear um, in other types of businesses, do we need a new re another restaurant? It's only going to cannibalize other restaurants. Do we need another grocery store? It's only going to affect um, other businesses that we have in town. So it's it's a fact of life that um, <clears throat> if there's a market need, people will want to develop and provide a product that's going to be desirable. And uh, we've made an application that establishes there is a need. And we've met all of the requirements. Your POCD suggests that this is a logical site for something like this. Um, and, you know, we hope it won't be negative on this gentleman's business. We don't think it will be. And we think the need will continue to grow as people get more and more used to putting their, their goods in self-storage. Um, so we hope that considering all that, that you'll still be able to approve this application. Thank you. And I'd like to look at the team and see if there's anything else anybody else wants to say, but uh, it doesn't look like it. So okay. thank you. Okay. So at this point, we're closing the public hearing. Thank you. 
Shannon, thinking about that. So we have a zone change, right? And the site plan. So two. Uh, separate zone change, special permit and site plan. Like when we vote, should just two motions, right? Or you think uh, one appropriate motion, or just do it together? Just uh, it can be done. It, it it can be done as one. Um, <laughs> it can be done as one. They will have differing effective dates, and there's a landscape buffer waiver required. It does not. It does not require a five six vote. It's just a waiver that's required. Um, I have to go back through. Uh, You're checking. Okay. Because of the side yard landscape buffer um, adjacent to a residential area. So it ta it's talked about in the agenda review. Yep. Okay. So we uh, need a motion and a second. Before discussion, please. Okay. <laughs> you taking I'm, it on? All right. I guess the I'll whole entire meeting. Okay. Thank you. I missed you, Patrick. By the way, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing. Yeah, I know. Uh, okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the. Um, Bulwark LLC's application for a change of zone from an R80 to C1 and approve a special permit and site plan approval for construction of a self-storage facility located on lots 8120 and 8122 Colt Highway across from 242 Colt Highway. Second. Second. Okay. All right, discussion. In favor of our position. Yeah, go, oh, go ahead. Oh I, I thought <laughs> I yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that all right? I Does anyone want to go first? Go first. Yeah, go yeah. Fire away. So I, I think this site, I think the applicant's attorney said it last time. It's I think for me it's either sort of dormant or it's this C1, right? And mm -hmm. what type of um sort of business or or C1 type of uh, use do we want for this site again it's sort of a tricky part so part of route six um based on testimony tonight there seems to be a little bit more cars than i expected so the site plan and just driving up and down it and thinking about people making that u-turn back up back up the hill makes me concerned um, so, so that's my sort of thought process, but again, for a use, there's not, in theory, a ton of people coming and going. It's not, you know, it's like a, a Walmart or a big commercial where a lot of people, you need a, a traffic sign. So that, that's kind of my initial thoughts there. Okay. Patrick. Um, I mean, I agree with what, with what he's saying. I don't, I don't know how many people would do a U-turn on Route 6. That's that's insane. I guess they would use other <laughs> business, I think, probably, right? That's, like that, that's saying, sort yeah. of my my yeah. point is we're taking traffic, you know, we're taking motor vehicles or tra off the site. And, and, but how much is that up to us to say, well, we're making people do right turn only. And then how much do we say, well, 50% of the people are going to make a U-turn or use another business to turn around? And how, how much is that a consideration or not to you know, approve or deny this application. That's that's the biggest one for me. This is the safety? Yeah, is the safety. I think the use of a storage facility in the height kind of meets the requirements. And again, this area of town, I, I think it makes sense to me. It's my perspective. Sorry to tell you, Patrick. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with that. Um, I guess it's unfortunate they are going to go use the other businesses, right? Because that's the easiest way. Um, you know, I don't, I, I maybe I'll have a few that are just going to break the rules and jump the multiple curb. Yeah. Um, but I'm assuming it's aggressive enough without seeing it. Um, it's probably most likely aggressive enough to really get them to go that way. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the fact that the DOT, you know, like they mentioned, I mean, it's something that we could ask, right. Not make it a condition because then the, the right. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe we do that where, where we say, if you can, if the DOT allows you to, 
Um, if the DOT doesn't, obviously they have their reasons on, on why they don't. It's safer to take the chance of the U-turn or whatever it is. Um, in terms of the the use of it, again, I don't know. You know, I was responding. Yeah, uh, my gut is that it seems like, first of all, who would want to make that type of investment, right? For it just to fail. Um, so it, and it seems like with with all the apartments that are that I've witnessed and voted on, just in maybe some in that three mile radius, you know, um, it seems like it's the demand would be up. But again, I don't know. I've never checked it. Um, but that's it. I mean, I, okay. I I agree with everything that Matt said. Okay. How about you, Scott? So opposition. I'm not really factoring the business need in at all okay. for the same reason, the example of the restaurant, like I'm not sure that's in our place to really determine what the economics of it are. But to be honest, I don't see this fitting in our town and I don't see it fitting in that space. And I know we're making comparisons. There's commercial across the street. To me, they're much less obtrusive than this is. And you've got large buildings down the street, but they all face the other way as well. So you're not, the exposure to Route 6 is not the same. I'm really having a hard time getting past this being part of what people see when they come into Farmington. Okay. Good. I'm good. Okay. Liz? Uh, well, I, I feel that this is, the inappropriate location for this because of the commercial across the street and it is route six. Uh, I'd love to see it maybe be two stories. And I think that would be a little easier and more, more palatable. Um, I, it is a large structure. I do like what the revisions that have come out. I think that is much more responsive to, or much more amenable to our um to farmington uh personal experience with uh with the storage um lived in bloomfield and we had a place in avon but my husband worked across the street <laughs> so it was very easy um but there is uh, uh, and we were the once a year or twice a year users not the frequent not the saturday afternoon visit my stuff type people so uh, I, I I tend to agree with Patrick that yeah it just seems like there's there is a need again I don't know I haven't researched it so good location not sold on how big it is okay James um, yeah a couple a couple of things um, first I just wanted to um, thank the applicant for addressing some of the concerns that I had last meeting um, with regards to the aesthetics. Um, you know, putting the brick, the facade, um, changing it up a little bit. It's less of an eyesore than it was originally. Um, so it looks a lot better. And I understand the, the, the color component of it being a brand element more so than anything else. But I, you know, I, I agree with uh, my fellow commissioners about the size um, is a little bit tough. Um, but um, the zone change is a no brainer. I feel like, you know, it's right, right in line with the POCD. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like for this particular parcel, low traffic is exactly what we would need for this parcel and for it to to work um so this is like a perfect type of business um with scott on the fact that like the business need and you know what those compares that's not in our purview and that's that's the for the the business owner to uh to worry about um but i i yeah i'm i'm a little on the fence with regards to the size um but at the same time i think it's a it's a good thing to put something there. You know, Matt, your earlier comment about having it being vacant or, or dormant or having something there is, and you know, I, I know that who knows what else could potentially go here if someone wanted to do the same thing, come in and do another zone change um, and what type of business would be an alternative to this. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, I, don't, I don't know what we'd get um that's probably that's better suited for the parcel so that's kind of where my head's at thank you matthew unfortunately you don't get to participate <laughs> okay you're you're good okay um so thank you so thank you for um 
all the commissioners uh, for the great questions. Obviously, you're spending time reviewing all the documentation, which has been fabulous by this applicant. Um, I don't think it fits our town. Uh, I don't see people coming from West Hartford um, or Avon or other nearby communities to this location because they have their own storage uh, facilities. I also think it's just very, very large. And um, that I, I understand that we're in a commercial part of Route 6, but that corner, I just don't think it's a great idea to develop that corner. Uh, and that's obviously my opinion only, um, but I definitely will not be supporting this application. All right, we have questions for Shane, go ahead. Someone second them. Did someone second the motion from, yeah, yeah James. James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yep. James? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I'm in, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. You're in. Oh, we know. Yeah. We know. <laughs> Any questions for Shannon? We're good. Everybody good? So yes, go ahead. Yes. Discussion, right? Yes, it is. Yep. is it the, si the size of the building that, because I guess you think of this as a little bit of a gateway into the Farmington Valley, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking, the entrance, it, if, if, if it is, right, like come, coming down the hill, coming down through six, and there's a big storage facility on the right-hand side as you enter the like, I don't, I'm not sure we can reduce that at this point to approve it, right? So, again, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, a little, it's large, but in this area, there's not, you know, there's not nothing really around it except... For storage or... or I don't think the area is very pretty anyways, right? Like it's not in that. You don't like those mafia blocks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. I, I guess I, I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't know how much, how much it's going to, how much it's going to change the complexion of the area. You know what I mean? Does it need yeah. to go? You're okay. Whatever the data. Yeah. All right. So where are we going with this? Are we ready to vote? Are you were thinking of adding a condition, Matt? Uh, just based on commentary, if anyone is thinking that, I mean, I don't think we can add a condition to shrink the size of the building, no. right? So um, the, the site plan, I would love to add a, a condition on the site plan because of my sort of U-turn or turn into <laughs> another business. I, I just don't, I can't see one that actually works because... We're trying to change behavior off-site, right? So just keeping it the left on-site is that if that's more dangerous. So uh, again, and, that that was the only that was the only one for me. But again, I just don't think there is one. Yeah, people there. Are, people are going to do what they're, they're going to do. do. Right? You you, you, you control them right there. That's all they and can do. Is an example? You know, um, Treehouse up in Massachusetts, how they had the all, when they first. Built it. Rory? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how they had though they had but they had a right they had a right turn only. Yeah. And then there was the car dealerships up there. And then oh, yeah. all the car dealerships had signs that said yeah. no U-turn all up the all up that road. Yeah. And then Trios finally got it approved to take the left hand turn. Got so it. I think it's gonna end up being a situation it's where it'll it it'll go a right turn yeah. only. <laughs> and if the businesses get pissed, then yeah. they can just come back and ask for a revision or something. What is the nearest business, anyways? Isn't it pretty far up the road? Like, yeah, right. Right. Well, you like, got to go up all the way down. Like, right. yeah, not, yeah, not CVS, not that far, but no, well, no, it is. It, the only close. other option is to go on reservoir, take a right onto reservoir, or a uh, yeah, truck, uh, can't, I'm gonna, and yeah. a truck yeah. can't do. I'm going to interject yeah. on this just for clarity, just so. So this is the parcel. Mm -hmm. The stream crossing is roughly midway through the parcel. So this. This is the developed area. Oh, yeah. So if you make a right turn out, so, the driveways uh, yeah, immediately. Yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly so, what I did. This one. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you, Shannon. It's going to be the first one. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so I thought right. you need to understand the orientation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's good. And so those two businesses could, in theory, be affected by people take. I mean, again, people take a right and have to go right, right? So. But again, I don't know if it's, it's enough for me to vote no on. If you're not familiar with the area, right? Because we're attracting people from all over. Correct. Right? Uh, you're going to hopefully follow signage. You you probably, I can't imagine someone, I guess if you're completely uh, disobeying the right turn only, right? 
I mean, you maybe would do it enough hours, you know what I mean? But that road, I don't know. I think we should leave that right turn only. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. I don't think making a left makes any sense. I don't okay. think they'll get approved. I think but just, yeah. yeah. I think you control what you can control, which is on that property. Yeah. And if you make it a right turn only lane, then that's their option. Right. So, to and right. Well, one of them is going to be left turn, right? So one of the end. Well, yes. But the, yep. mm -hmm. Are we so. comfortable? Vote? Do we know what we're voting on? Mm -hmm. Yes. We're comfortable. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Mm -hmm. we're, vo we're voting on the zone change. Yeah. And then the special site permit and site plan. All together. Yeah. Vote. Okay. So we need a, we'll do one by one? Uh, certainly. All right. Thank you. Should we start on that side? Just kidding. <laughs> I'll go. Give Matt a break. Yeah, I'll go. I'm, I'm a yes. I'm a yes. No. No. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question, Jim? Yes. Do we have a date for the change? Uh, the, if the, uh, Commission's agreeable, then the dates as noted in the um, in, in the agenda review will hold with a recommended date of the zone changes 16 days after the date of yeah. publication, and then the recommended effective date of the special permit and site plan would be 17 days after the date of publication. Thank you. We should probably start reading that again, huh? <laughs> we were reading it into the motions and oh, then we stopped. Sorry. But is it, Robin, I'll make sure it's in the letter. Make sure it's in the decision. The effective date of the zone change and the special time. Yeah. No, oh, she's telling you. No, I'll make sure it's in your decision letter. We, effective date. Yeah. We, yep. Didn't we pass the rule? We don't have to necessarily. Well, we did. So it also, uh, Robin, we've subsequently made a um, uh, change to the zoning regulation that if it's neglected to be discussed specifically, then it's. 15 days. I don't can't remember. It's 15 or 16 days after the date of the approval. 15. That's right. So the, there was a zone uh, regulation change. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Uh, planner's report. Yes. I've got a few. I actually have a handful of items to chat with you briefly on. Sounds good. Okay, so the first is um, I've got Mott Corporation. You'll recall mm. should have been. they're expanding, right? They're expanding over at uh, New Britain Avenue. On New Britain Avenue, they're taking in a portion of the 1690 yep. uh, building. So, as part of their uh, working through construction items and working with Eversource, uh, there's a handful of changes. So I've already gone ahead and I've approved since everything in this particular case was a minimization of what had been approved, but this is just an update for the commission. Uh, the generator size, the size of the generator pad was reduced from 22 by 50 to 13 by 29. And this is the, the generator pad uh, located at the, uh, the edge of the parking area. The uh, chiller units from went from four to two. The chiller units were right immediately adjacent to the building. Uh, the revised proposed transformers at the northeast corner of the building went, uh, I think, from three is what they had shown originally. So we are now at uh, one that's uh, for current use, one for future use, and then uh, one was eliminated. So we've gone from three to two. Uh, there's a concrete pad added for a gas meter here, just at the very edge of the northeast corner of the building. Again, it's a two by three. Uh, and a light pole was moved, um, I believe, uh, from this vicinity over uh, just closer to the driveway. So rather than it being kind of hanging in the middle of nowhere, it was mo moved closer to the uh, driveway in the upper parking lot uh, near the new walk. So those were um, changes that the generator, chiller, and transformer all were um, requests from Eversource as part of their power supply request to Eversource. Uh, 
So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. All good. Okay. Is that project delayed though, or by, because of this or no? Uh, the projects would delay. I think part of the delay has been coordinating with Eversource okay. for power for this area. Um, we've been made aware that there's been um, a few challenges with that. Uh, Mont Corporation isn't the only one experiencing this uh, due to the large power demand of the facility, the refrigeration facility in Plainville. Mm. Um, uh -huh. It's now made a challenge for Eversource to supply uh, some of the additional demand for the industrial customers. So that's being worked through. Um, so, but yes, that's uh, some of the challenge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got three three other things. I'm going to start with the quickest one. Um, Krog yeah. survey. Uh, Garrett had sent an email. You were all included in an email on June 2nd that Garrett sent out. Um, serve, uh, CROG is doing their regional uh, POCD, right? So we're part of CROG. They're doing their regional POCD. As part of that, they are doing, they've sent out a survey and asked us to distribute it far and wide. So all the land use commissions received it directly. It will go in the summer newsletter. The survey is open until I believe the end of July. So um, I will probably resend it so it pops up for you. But if you do a search in your email for Garrett, okay. um, it should come up. Please, if you have the time, I think it's just a, a handful of minutes. Um, but it would be helpful to try to get some feedback. Um, it's one thing for them to get feedback from staff. Mm -hmm. It's a whole nother different, you know, you as commissioners have a, you know, a slightly different lens. And then even the, um, you know, residents as a whole, if you're part of an HOA or a neighborhood group email, group text message, uh, feel free to send it. Like I said, it will get out uh, to the populace through our summer newsletter. We're also working on getting it out on uh, Explore Farmington and on the webpage. Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, next item. Our zoning, uh, we're working on a zoning text amendment for our industrial zones for the uh, commercial restricted and the commercial uh, C1 zone, uh, looking at altering our impervious cover uh, requirement. So we were at the 40% impervious coverage, and then we've got 50% uh, with a 5-6 vote. It's pretty standard across pretty much all the playing fields in, in Farmington. Our, um, you know, some of our more uh, medical office and special innovation zone has slightly higher impervious coverage. Um, as we look at this, there's no more, there's not a lot of additional developable land in Farmington and certainly not for some of our industrial um, partners or, or, or uh, businesses in town. So what we're looking at doing, um, for me, looking at it, the impervious coverage, the, the largest driving force with reducing impervious coverage, not just from the, uh, obviously the aesthetics of it is one element, um, but the stormwater runoff and stormwater management. So not only the volume of runoff, but the quantity of, um, the quality of that runoff and having uh, an ability to infiltrate uh, water back into the groundwater uh, table. So we're looking at uh, doing a modification to the regulation that will allow uh, a higher impervious coverage with a requirement of a higher uh, stormwater infiltration, stormwater um, quality requirements, uh, even above what our MS4, like probably doubling what the MS4 water quality um, uh, infiltration requirements are. Um, interestingly, many of our industrial zones are within uh, two aquifers. To the south, where we have uh, Spring Lane, High, Johnson, Johnson, there's the FIP aquifer, and it actually, it runs along our southern border, and in, in the balance of it is in Plainville, um, that aquifer. And then the other area along the Brick Rock, Brickyard Road area um, is our sand and stone aquifer, and that comes down uh, into Farmington Avenue as well. 
um, and right into where the midpoint development is. So this is it, it, the request for staff. To, th this is something, uh, if I'm completely honest, I had already kind of kicked around in my head because Rose and I talk about, well, we're limited with the 40, the 40 and 50% coverage. What are we, you know, what are our options? How do we get around this? And this is something that I've been thinking about. Way in the back reaches, things percolate in Shannon's head for a while and they just kind of ruminate there. Um, it has been brought to the forefront because there is a developer that's interested in, in doing something else. Um, it, it actually ultimately may impact this property that's up on the, the screen. But nonetheless, um, we're going to look at, for us, from a town standpoint, I felt it, um, since it would be whole scale looking at the industrial properties, that this would be a town-sponsored text amendment to take a look at. Um, working to have the application put forth um, at the next meeting to be accepted and then the hearing open. We'll see whether we open it in the first meeting in July. We might run it for two hearings so that there's plenty of time to talk and ask questions and kick things around. Um, so this is a heads up. This is a heads up. Yep. So it's not coming more out of the blue than this conversation already is. Um, but if there's questions or things that you're thinking of, um, or it sparks something, um, obviously feel free. It's a town, it'll be, it's, like I said, a town um, proposed amendment. So it's kind of free game. If we don't like something, we change it. You don't agree with me, that's fine. Perfectly fine. So uh, it's what, um, you know, what we, we think is best. Um, so there's a variety of metrics. So, so that was, um, that was the second thing. Uh, the third thing is the moratorium. Mm. The moratorium as it stands is set to expire on July 20th, I think is the date we have. Um, I have gone back and I've uh, talked with Bob DiCrescenzo to find <laughs> out exactly if, if the commission uh, desires to do so, how best to extend and if it required reopening the public hearing. Uh, or having a new public in a reopening, but have, noticing and doing a whole new public hearing. Um, so in reviewing it with Bob, he said no, because of how it was, we originally proposed the one-year moratorium, mm -hmm. and then we broke it into six and six. So that option to extend is pretty much at your purview. What I would do is put it on as a new business item. Um, so that would have to be no later than that first meeting in July as a new business item to vote to extend the moratorium because the first meeting in July is 17th. So we go July 17th and July 31st. We got pushed because, because of, of the July 4th holiday. Yeah. Um, so if there's a general sense and we can chat about it a little bit now, we do, we do have um, a few work session items to talk about. And there is a gentleman on the phone to talk about oh, geez, the okay. ADU. Um, yeah. uh, item, but if there's a, a quick one or two comments regarding or thoughts on that, or we can come back to that. We can talk about ADU and then come back to yeah. discussing moratorium extensions if you want. And then um, I we think we should let the gentleman yeah. speak. Yeah. All right. So, sorry. All right. Um, okay. So, gotta drive. Okay, John, can you hear me? Uh, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Can. Okay. So, uh, uh, John, if you would, just for the, so just so you know where we, uh, I did share with uh, the commission your thoughts on uh, ADU, so that uh, that draft memo you had sent to me. Um, if you could just do a brief introduction of yourself so the commission understands uh, the point of view you're coming from um, and then discuss your thoughts um, on the ADU, that would be helpful. So you've got the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is John Galvin and um, I'm not surprised that we ran so late, but I'm, I'm actually shocked that there's two John Galvins there tonight. Uh, that was the gentleman opposing the storage unit was also named John Galvin. Really confused me there for a while. Um, 
Yeah, my name is John Galvin. I'm joined, I think they're still online, uh, by my sister Noreen Galvin and Michelle Willis. Uh, they're the owners of 162 Woodpond Road in Farmington. Uh, we were interested, uh, bought the property a year and a half or so ago, needed major renovations. It's still Sikorsky property. And it, it's on a large parcel on the lake. It has a, a three bedroom, uh, I'm sorry, three car garage with a space above that's already finished. Um, I think it was used as an art studio and or a uh, yoga studio. So it is a finished unit, does not have plumbing. Thought it would be uh, wonderful for uh, an AD. Wow. We're losing it. Yep. Lost the sound. Lost you. Thanks. So the garage is detached, right? In general. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're in and out a little bit, John. Unfortunately, your connection seems um, compromised a bit. Okay. Are you, uh, am I still in and out now? No, you're a little better right now. Okay. Uh, let's hope it stays. So uh, I don't know how much of that you caught, but interested in putting a, uh, an ADU in an already finished space above a three-car garage. Uh, everything is, to my understanding, if not, I think it's originally permitted, certainly grandfathered. Um, so uh, I've done a quite a bit of renovations in Connecticut down in uh, Fairfield um, before moving out to California, which is where I am now. So uh, it's, it's only dinner time here. I thank you guys for hanging in. Um, uh, California did pass an ADU uh, law. And uh, so that was a, a big deal in California for the last two years. And uh, when I came out here, I slowed things down. And I've only done historic home renovations. I've done two. Um, one had a detached ADU from an existing, really was a barn. Uh, horse barn, and the other was a junior ADU. Um, so I have some familiarity with ADUs from building them and the code, and, and just in general researching ADUs um, policies across the country in the different states. Uh, so I was heartened to see that the affordable uh, housing plan included recommendations uh, that the commission and the um, town council approved. That's not, there are only recommendations, but I would imagine in uh, litigating that, that uh, at least the framework for an ADU policy, those three points to allow um, unrelated people to rent and have detached ADUs that those are really the heart of just about every ADU policy. Um, where they tend to differ is in uh, whether there's going to be any zoning variances of, on a particular single family uh, residence. Does it have to adhere to lot coverages, setbacks, et cetera? There are some differences there, although there's a lot more commonalities. Uh, parking is another issue and so forth. Um, I know that in just researching ADUs, you'll hear one thing that's said all the time and that they're low hanging fruit. In, uh, and that's why they're in most people's uh, housing plans or strategies. Um, and they say that because it's, uh, it, most of these slip pretty easily into existing uh, zoning regulations uh, so that they begin, um, they don't need special uh, permits, etc. cetera. Um, they're pretty much, as, if they're built right, they're pretty invisible. Um, they tend to be at the back of uh, existing houses uh, and they can be scaled. So typically they, they're about 30% of uh, the size of the existing house and so forth. But so that's the good side. And there's all sorts of reasons. Um, on, on who they serve. Uh, predominantly, it's almost a senior citizen issue. I mean, the people who build these, about 60 to 70% build it either for a senior or it's built by a senior. Um, so 
lots of good things to be said about ADUs. Uh, probably the downside is that people uh, or town planners and commissions such as yourself are overly optimistic on how many units actually get built. And so this is strictly anecdotal from my own experience and my conversations with a few pl town planners I've worked with. Um, the town that I built in uh, is about half the size of Farmington, um, built about four ADUs in the first year they were approved. They were all uh, 600 square feet or less, uh, studios or one bedrooms occupied by one person. Um, and I think all of them, at least the two that I built were for seniors. Uh, the town Fairfield would have a lot of experience with the town planner. I called them and um, what they did was what might have been a better way to go uh, in during the opt-out phase was to do an opt-out and um, design your own regulations at the same time. And that's what Fairfield did. So Fairfield's been up and running with ADUs, I think, for at least a year, maybe 18 months. And I think they have eight permits issued for the entire town. I don't know how many of those got built, certainly not all eight. Um, and Fairfield's got 60,000 people. And then there's, there's a host of other, um, you know, towns that have them, and I haven't done the research, but I would think that in approaching whether you're going to approve ADUs and how quickly to approve ADUs, et cetera, that the sort of guiding principle needs to be that, well, we want to encourage people or make it make the regulations flexible enough so that people who need this can can build them but at the same time restrict to the extent that you don't have bad bad outcomes um so that's that's kind of the guiding principle here and i think that a lot of the uh pushback against adus is that it's going to overburden the sewer system, the school system, public services, parking, et cetera. And quite frankly, um, they tend, I wouldn't say they're a nothing burger, <laughs> but uh, not a lot of these actually wind up getting built. Now, having said that, with the housing issue that everybody's facing, particularly with uh, housing for singles, not being able to do everything is uh, no reason to do nothing. And if you build three or four of these a year, at the end of your five-year plan, you have something akin to a small apartment building with none of the disruption. And it also, it addresses a completely different population that might live in an apartment building. So mom is mom and dad or uh, they don't need the big house anymore. They don't want to leave their property. They don't want to move into an apartment in town. They build a cute little cottage in the back, often looks better than the house, quite frankly. And the house then can be given over to their children who are struggling with the price of housing. Um, that actually is more common than couples building the cottage for mom to move into. That, that was one surprise for me. But um, and there's, there's a host of other, obviously some people will rent to make some more money. Uh, again, seniors who, uh, the house taxes are making the housing somewhat unaffordable, can stay in the house if the rent is, um, uh, if, if the mortgage is sub or taxes are subsidized by a rental. So, uh, you know, again, uh, given the hour, I, I don't think we have time to go through the proposal. What I was hoping to do tonight was to get the whole issue of ADUs back on the radar. I know last year when we opted out, and Matt, I think it was you, <laughs> uh, said uh, deadlines have a way of spurring action, you know, and, um, you know, the opt-in had a deadline, so I mean, they opt out, so uh, the town opted out, but there was no deadline put on when the issue might be picked up again. So I was hoping they'd just get it back in front of the commission and see whether through uh, 
a type of meeting like this or a, a separate working group, um, the commission could decide whether they want to move forward at all or in what manner they might want to move forward on uh, AD, on relaxing ADU regulations. Um, so that's, uh, and of course, I'll, I'll, I'll answer any questions about the document that I uh, had sent to Shannon. But uh, again, thanks for hanging in there. I know it's, I guess it's 10 o'clock your time, but uh, I appreciate uh, your uh, taking the time. Thank you, Mr. Galvin. And uh, we've been actually meeting way past this. So <laughs> this is early. So we'll definitely uh, uh, go to all the, obviously to every commissioner. I can't even speak. There you go. <laughs> but so uh, Mr. Galvin, what, what is your background? Like your builder or? Um, mm, uh, I, I spent a lot of years in, uh, uh, banking in training and development, uh, and, uh, sort of a, a hobby, probably what I should have done from the beginning was to build. And I started out by building a, uh, two family house for my wife's parents and my parents. Uh, you can hear from my accent. I grew up in the Bronx. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you think it's funny back there out here they're just whatever i need a translator um but um uh, you know we were the first time home buyers and my parents and my uh wife's parents were you know uh stuck in the bronx and really couldn't afford the you know property and i built a duplex for them to live in and uh i i loved it and i kept on doing it so i always did it through my banking career and then right after 9 11 i was downtown for 9 11. i said you know i don't know if it had that impact but coincidentally i left banking and i started doing um construction uh sometime for family members but basically on spec i would just basically show me the worst falling down house in town and I'm the guy that you want to buy it. And that's, that's what happened out here in California, two historic properties that were um, deemed teardowns. Um, I thought they could be saved and, and I did. And um, I actually won uh, the Historical Society Award for both of them. So um, that's sort of my background. I'm not a, you know, people ask me, am I a builder? I say, I'm not an expert, but I know a lot. And in building, I've learned a lot about, um, building codes and although every town is different there's a lot that's very common in terms of how towns um manage the uh their land use and their concerns uh so when you read about adus and you read about comments from town planners and public comment uh in different states whether it's california where everybody thinks we're weird to Connecticut and towns in between, uh, the same issues are raised over and over again. And the one that I found, I, I wouldn't call it amusing, but is that um, the near hysteria sometimes <laughs> that you hear about how many ADUs are gonna be built. And then you see, so for example, in Fairfield, uh, it was an eight to one by the town commission to approve it. Um, nobody made an application so they actually started marketing uh adus to the public and like i said i think they only have about eight permits i don't know of any a lot of people will pull permits for these and then not build them when they see what the costs are they're not cheap to build okay. thank you mr galvin i was just uh you know you're clearly passionate about this topic uh thank you for coming in front of us uh, and i'll turn it over to the other commissioners. Um, I wasn't sure why Farmington, but I guess it's the connection to your sister. Are you talking to other towns also in Connecticut besides the Fairfield background or is it just Farmington at this point? Oh, uh, no, I mean, my, my interest is peaked obviously by wanting to build an ADU on the property. I mean, if you were to see the property, first of all, everyone thinks it's the house when it's not because it's the house is down by the lake. And when you tell them, no, it's not, they all assumed it's already rented because I think so, for some time there was a lot of back and forth because it was used as some sort of studio. Okay. Uh, so I only talked to uh, Town of Fairfield uh, because, you know, I know the town planner or the second, the 
assistant town planner and just to get a feel for, you know, is this under use of ADUs a, uh, an anomaly or not? And, and, and it may be, and, and I think that would probably be the very next step or at least done in conjunction if there was a working group. And, you know, if you want to volunteer me, I'm, <laughs> I, won't, I won't charge you like the consultant. I did speak to your consultant also. Uh, just to get a handle on, you know, is this a, is this like, this is how ADUs work everywhere? And it's starting to look like that because when, when people actually, so for example, you need the, um, you need to have the lot coverage. You need to have the setback from the main house. You can't build it in front. You can't build on the sides. Um, it's, uh, you're constrained by the size of your existing house. It could be 30 to 50%. So you will, you're winding up building maybe a six, 700 square foot um, ADU. And even I find it hard to build one for less than 200,000. So when you take, when you just do the numbers on it, people say, oh, it just, you know, so they pull the permit and then they get the, and, you know, they go through all of that and they're like, this just isn't worth it. And I think that's part of the uh, issue. It would be good if towns um, incentivized people to do it um, by tax breaks and so forth, but that's a whole other issue and it gets complicated. Most towns have shied away from making these zones specific or have to be affordable or whatever. I mean, that's, that's sort of an add on. Uh, Fairfield has a little bit of an incentive by allowing people to put uh, more than three people or more than two people if it's affordable, uh, but that really hasn't attracted anybody. Okay, uh, let me uh, turn it over to the commissioners for just immediate uh, questions or feedback. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, hey, thank, thank you, Mr. Galvin, for joining us. <clears throat> So based on your last comment about a two hundred thousand dollar, you know, do you think this these units fall into the affordable housing issue we have here in the state of Connecticut, or is this more of just trying to make our land use a little more less restrictive? I think it's both. I mean, I I, I did notice that in the affordable housing plan, it did not specify uh, any incentives to make these affordable housing and. I, you know, I'm not sure what the numbers are. I, I, I'm going to guess maybe it's twelve to fourteen hundred dollars for a one-bedroom rental under the Affordable Act, uh, affordable uh, uh, definition. Uh, Shannon would know better, but yeah, if you build a two hundred thousand dollar unit, and I'm not saying you couldn't slap together something for a hundred thousand, uh, you know, but by the time you do all the uh, sewer and water and everything else it gets 200 is probably a pretty good you know conservative number to work with and then you think about what the mortgage would be on that and the town one of the pluses is that the town gets more tax income probably about two thousand three thousand for each of these units a year uh and then you add on the extra taxes the homeowner pays because of the um because now it's it's got a rental. Nobody's making any money at thirteen hundred dollars uh, under the affordable, so nobody will build them. Um, but if the town was really wanted to add incentivize, so for example, if a developer builds a an apartment complex, he's incentivized by you know density or whatever variances you give him. The homeowner doesn't have that, um, but it might be. You know, if you make it affordable, we won't um, we won't tax it, or even give you a tax credit. So it could be both. It, it could be plain vanilla the way it is in California and most states. Um, I think even the um, I think even the uh, the actually was that twenty one twenty nine or whatever it is that that yes. we had to opt out of. Yes, I think that specified that you couldn't. You couldn't um, make them right um, be affordable. I always think of affordable with the large A meaning you got to be income guidelines, and small A meaning 
we don't have any of these. And the fact that you build them will sort of drive down prices. Um, so it, yeah, it, it, that's, that's all part of the ongoing discussion where towns have it. My sense is that towns have looked at that and fallen out of it saying, nobody's going to build it if you do that. There's no incentive unless we put the incentive in there. We don't have the money to make it an incentive. So. You're good, Matt. Got it. I'm good. Thank you. Patrick, comments for? Um, just, yeah, just a comment. It's interesting. You said 200,000 and that doesn't include land. You know, yeah. that's just the unit itself. Um, but you're building so, on existing. On an exist, right. I mean, parcel. yeah. So, I mean, you're that yeah. It's just building. Yeah. Down. So, so it runs the gamut. Um, the, and, and you'll hear all sorts of numbers. I remember in the good old days, it was, uh, you tried to keep it under a hundred dollars a square foot. Well, <laughs> um, very good old days, long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think $300 a square foot is, is an aggressive number to use for building. So if you're building a, you know, 600 square foot unit, it gets up there, you know, fees. Uh, when I built properties, I would allow 5% for fees. Now it's gotta be 10%. Um, uh, the, you know, the building code, whether you're building a 600 square foot unit uh, and, you know, especially here in California, all the tie down work that you have to do. There's um, the last house I did, I spent almost $3,000 just on those tie down hardware, not the labor to install them. So all of that's gotten driven pri and the price, you know, sheet of plywood. Remember the good old days when it was 30 bucks? Now it's like 90. It came down from 130. So yeah, it's it's 300 would be a safe number. And so that's $200,000. I mean, building new. Now, in our case, because I kind of know what I'm doing and it's an existing structure, it's already been finished, but all the framing, but it needs to be rewired, replumbed better insulation and so forth, it's probably closer to uh, $200 a square foot. Okay, thank you. Um, right. What's your reaction to Mr. Galvin's? Uh, yeah, no questions. Just thank you for bringing back to the forefront. I, it gives us some things to think about for sure and appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Liz? Uh, I will echo that. There's uh, nothing specific right offhand, but uh, yeah, it's it's... It's an interesting subject, something that we need to, to think more about. So thanks for bringing it up. All right, and James? Um, yeah, there's an echo in here. Um, so, so similarly, um, yeah, I mean, it's not something that I know a ton about. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for the discussion. Thanks for the time. Um, look forward to potentially mm -hmm. continuing the discussion at a later date. And Matthew? I'll be the final echo. All right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much the same thing. I think it's an important component, um, but it's not a panacea for our affordable housing issue. Right. All right. Right. It's just right. a right. part of it. Yeah, it's it's the double-edged sword of ADUs. As somebody said, like done right, they're invisible uh, and they're pretty easy to fold into the code. Um, if, unless you start making all sorts of, you know, other, uh, but most, most, most jurisdictions don't. It's just, that's your zone. You can have an ADU. You got to abide by the setbacks. You got to abide by the lot coverage, uh, 16 feet high. So it's one, so it, it, there's some plain vanilla plans out there that you see going on. So that's the night, the good part. The bad part is no, it's not a panacea. As a matter of fact, um, housing advocates who, really want more public housing will deride ADUs as being just a band-aid that towns come up with to say they're doing something. So <laughs> not everybody, but that's the only really negative thing that I've heard about ADUs that for towns that actually have them and get them built is that, eh, you know, it was a nothing burger. So I, th I think there's a, I think there's a way of doing it, and I know Shannon uh, suggested just rolling out with uh, make the existing ones that are under the same roof line how you know that are in houses uh, allowed to be for uh, rented to non-related parties, 
And I think that's okay. That's probably where you're going to really get nothing. New Haven did that, and in two years, they had zero people take them up on it. Um, I think, oh, I, and by the way, one interesting thing uh, that came up when I was speaking to a town planner uh, here in California is that they had had, they were already looking at the issue because they had three or four fires in illegal ADUs. And so it really, now, now I'm sure not everybody comes forward because they don't want to spend the money or whatever, but he said that three quarters of the first applications for, for, for existing ADUs for people to bring them up to code. So that's, that's a nice um, sort of side benefit. And, and that'll certainly apply to whatever moves you make on your existing ADUs or you know, ADUs and attached units. I, you know, we'd be naive to think that everybody is, that every ADU in Farmington is uh, within the house and rented to a relative or a worker. I mean, it's just, you know, the nature of things. Um, so it gets, a, it gets, it's almost a moratorium for people who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. It, it's a cousin, right? Uncle, yeah. cousin or uncle living there. Never mind. Yeah, well, I, I, I think the commission should have a meeting every month where all ADUs have to bring in their genealogy charts and uh, <laughs> oh, okay. for a minute and birth, okay. and birth certificates, <laughs> <laughs> DNA <laughs> testing. Yeah. So thank you for um, your document. We appreciate it. I'm sure you will be following this topic for in Farmington for sure. Um, we do have to decide, right, what we're doing with well, the moratorium itself. Yeah, right? itself. So, yeah. Yep. So. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you very we much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Sure. Going back to so yes. So going back to um, moratorium. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if there is an appetite for extending at all. Um, if there is, my recommendation is to not go past October 1st. Oct and the reason being is October 1st starts, I'll say, the formal campaign season um, with elections in November. And it doesn't, it, you know, I think the moratorium gives us sufficient time, oh, hopefully. <laughs> the intent is sufficient time to uh, have the discussions. And then if we're still finishing out a public hearing into October or November, I think that's fine. Um, but I think, um, you know, if we're gonna be having some active conversations, we gotta go October 1st in order to get anything meaningful accomplished with the group of you yep. um, before that no. changes or not or whatever, however that mix shakes out uh, for January, Yep. so. It's shaking for sure. Um, so um, I know it's, I don't even know what that means. So we have no no meeting in July, right? Or a break in July? No. So August August typically there's I mean, August, meeting. Geez. So there's two yes. meetings in July, and then we've got July seventeenth and July thirty first. So if we are going to extend the moratorium, we have to have it on the agenda no later than the July seventeenth meeting. Yeah. I just uh, I guess where I'm going with it, and it's. Um, you're supposed to read my mind. Sorry about that. Is I when we go through these meetings. I just probably did this. Um, you know, last few months have been rough, right? With the whole yeah. right. big projects. I just my bandwidth. Like I, I wish we could have a meeting to, just to talk about this. Nothing. Okay. No other business. Okay. I don't know. Well, I can try. I can try, and I know I had put out the doodle poll, and then my may like may yeah. just yeah. it was it exploded. Silly. So uh, again, part of getting another meeting in yep. involves your staff having the opportunity to adequately prepare for the meeting, and yep. it just didn't right. happen in May. Um, so happy to do doodle poll again, and we can do uh, June and July and see what's available. Um, I'm happy to get an extra meeting in, and then we can decide yeah, to be more productive. Yeah, I think so. um, yeah, because if we're doing this after right. like mm -hmm. a time, right three hour meeting. Okay. Like, yep. All right. Um, six. Do you, would you even? 
what is six thirty? So I don't. I know some of you are coming from where. I don't know what everybody's personal schedules are. So is six thirty okay as a start time, or would you prefer leaving it at seven? Six. I would. I would go back to six too. So can I just ask a larger? So we don't think we can get anything done by July thirty first, and like we'd have to have a public hearing, Matt. So. So if we're going to change I, a zone regulation, so we yeah, haven't even had too, enough time so to we have do a, that. So, so we, we can't do that. Yeah, I don't even know if we've had a working well, session. Just, yeah, we've heard, really, yeah. we've heard about inclusionary zoning. We've heard about ADUs. We've heard about a, a, a lot of the things in the affordable housing plan already. So I think, can we just start putting like specifics on paper at the next meeting and say, okay, what, what is, we know what inclusionary zoning is, right? It's over five or six houses, 12% or a fee in lieu. And let's just start putting those numbers on paper. But it's I think we should start drafting, doing that. So I'm back to- Unless this, unless this again, my question is that the staff, we don't have time to do that. We need to draft, just, so you would need to draft the text amendment. Yeah. yeah. You folks should look at it really yeah. before we have yeah. and even accept it, right? Mm -hmm. So you should at least look at it. And then we would- need to note accept the application and run a public hearing so no you're not going to get that done okay so we so, should just so we would need a meeting to discuss what that text amendment should be consistent right because you need to under, right and it's and, different things right so do we want to change the accessory dwelling no. uh the the current the accessory apartment regulation as it is lift the the rental requirements mm -hmm. and what does that look like do you want to cons consider the detached accessory dwelling units and the pros and cons of that? And I've been in touch with Krog. I'm trying to get the, so as part of the Public Act 2129, Krog did a survey for our area towns, right? So these are the towns that are all part of Krog. There's 38 of us. Um, and they said, you know, who opted in and who opted out, the reason why, and do you already have it? Uh, uh, detached accessory dwelling unit reg. How many have you had constructed and whatnot? So it also gives us towns to start to chat with then about how or look at their regulation and then also chat with to find out how much this this is. Um, I think we do need to get a handle on how much we think there may be from an accessory dwelling unit and who, whether it's parents moving out or children moving back in um, and school children um, as part of all of this now I am now on a board of ed redistricting committee which board of ed has to redistrict every so often anyhow um, and there's an organic with our subdivisions there's an organic expectation that uh, they built into their projections of 30 roughly 30 to 35 new residences coming on board and then there's other algorithms they look at to figure out how many children that really equates to. Well, with having a thousand apartment units come on board, right? And now they have now aligned that it almost looks like they could peak at the same time, whether they actually all get there. There's other things in the universe that are impacting that. I, all I can say is I'm wildly popular at these meetings at the moment. Mm -hmm. Wildly popular. <laughs> So, um, you know, but I think that's a real consideration that if we're going to change something that allows single family residences to then have a whole nother dwelling unit on their property and it can be rented out and we're not going to put a restriction that it has to be a family member. Like right. these are all things that really need to be so, thought of. We're oh, not just going to, I, I, but the, I, to me, the ADU doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with the moratorium. That's more for the vision, subdivisions, mm -hmm. right? It was the, the whole thing. thing. So it's it, it was a moratorium. So it was a moratorium. You're you're right. Yes. So it was a moratorium on on it. It was a moratorium to give us all more time. So to do it, and have it, unless you think like the town staff, do we need to expand the moratorium to give the town staff more time to start looking at these issues? But right? that's like more, but I think more it's moratorium. It's both because you yeah. folks need to have an appropriate platform and understanding basis right. to make the decisions. And it was affordable housing. So the ADUs really are organic 
or for affordable housing, or as John referred to it as the little a, food, right? right? Mm -hmm. It's not the capital A affordable housing where we're getting, it's going to hit our 10% our threshold. No way. Both are important and both needs to be kept in mind. Um, and we may not chip, we, we may not chip at both of them. Part of it for me was just to, to try to get a pause so we can get an education platform, mm -hmm. which has been almost futile this year to date. So, um, but I mean, there's documents that are still up on that, that work site that everybody has access to. There's been questions asked and answered that are up on the, the uh, cloud. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it's there, but I think, um, and no, they, we do not have to do a regulation change under the, the moratorium. Like the regulation change can come after. Okay. Um, it's just whether or not you still want to pause in place. I, I mean, really, that's all it is. So we could still do additional work sessions. We can lift the moratorium. The, the moratorium was, the purpose of it was to try to get a pause. It didn't work as well as I thought it might have because we got... A few other and things, but that's what happened. The units during the moratorium, yeah, right. Yeah, so it came in beforehand, right? So I didn't think that six months was enough, right? Uh, but just whatever. But that's uh, neither here or there. I, I would continue. I would hope we continue with the moratorium and really get something done. But um, is that realistic? Is it realistic? I think so, at least for, I think things for like accessory dwelling unit, um, the apartments yeah. and the ADUs and deciding where we want to go with that. I think it is. Mm -hmm. With respect to inclusionary zoning, yeah. I think we can get to a point where we have a deeper conversation and an understanding, do we want to start, do we want to start to do a zoning regulation on that? Do we want to leave it, see where we get with accessory dwelling? I think we get to a point where we can tier some of the priorities okay. and say, okay, yes, we, we like this or we like a few aspects of this, but we don't like whatever X, Y, and Z. Um, so I guess it depends on how you choose to measure right. the progress. Right. For me, not everything is a whole scale change to the regulation. For me, it was an education platform and trying to take the affordable housing plan and say, okay, here's some deeper understanding of some of these things within the affordable housing plan. And these are from a, uh, a priority, like we're gonna take care of three of them this year, and then we're gonna sit and see how that, what it does, and then do three the following year or whatever the case may be. Could could the outcome be a, a roadmap that would get us towards? Mm -hmm. That's what. Okay. That's yeah. Basically, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, I guess it's a start. I mean, I know there are plenty of towns in our state that don't even have a plan. You know, mm -hmm. there so, are. Yep, yeah, there are a handful that yeah. haven't are del um, delayed in getting it adopted. But it is important, right? And there's like nothing, <laughs> nothing affordable. Um, so I I like your idea. So. July, what does July, we need to make it an agenda item to extend? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. So we would need to make it an agenda. I would put it on as new business to extend. So the moratorium. June 26th or the July 17th? Well, I can put it on on either one. It's just the July 17th is the drop. To, if it's not on July 17th, there, there's no appetite to extend. I mean, quite honestly, as your town planner, I don't really want to put something on the agenda that you're going to say no to anyway. So that's kind of why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if there's no appetite to extend, then I won't bother putting it on the agenda. Um, that is a no. <laughs> well, no, and that's, yeah, it I mean, doesn't have to be unanimous and, yeah. it, and everybody has their own thought process on it. That's fine. I mean, we're delaying development in the town because we want to try to give us all more time to do, but we've, look how many units we've approved during the moratorium. Now, listen, I'm in favor of the moratorium and I'm in favor of affordable housing but from a practical perspective yeah. where there's people involved in this industry, that's their jobs. And we're, just, we're preventing them from doing their jobs because of meeting time and times and we don't have time. So I'm just, again, trying to think of a holistic approach for everyone in town. I'm in favor of affordable housing. And, we, and if we can't do anything, related to affordable housing in the next month or couple months, I don't think we need to do, we need to solve the affordable housing in a regulation 
Because I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that in six months anyway. So again, just trying to think sort of larger picture here. I think a lot of us think the inclusionary zoning, and we the whole point of moratorium is a right. new development comes online, and we right. have no way to direct a developer right. to make that inclusionary or affordable, right? Or fee and lieu. Mm -hmm. So can we just can we focus on that because that's what's tied to the moratorium and extend the moratorium three months? And can we just yeah. check that one off mm -hmm. instead of a fuller, comprehensive one? That, well, I think that's, that's what Shannon was saying, wasn't yeah. it? That, right. like, so three let's go till October, October 1 September. instead of a full six months. That's three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, September. I I agree. I think if so, you you would uh, vote yes to extend it. I would vote yes to extend because I I just I I feel <laughs> one more time and and I I will agree. I mean, we got business. I got business. We, we built it. So have we still have time. We can do it without. We don't need a moratorium to act or not act. I think the the point of the moratorium is. We're missing, in theory, we're missing out on affordable units well, because yeah, the affordable, it, the moratorium didn't apply to any right. affordable housing. But it applies to. But it could, right? It, so if it, we if, the, if we open up the if we stop the moratorium today, yep, and do, we accept a new application tomorrow for a, piece for a of twenty land. house subdivision, we have no ability to, to mandate. To mandate inclusionary zoning or ma mandate Correct. in lieu. Yes. That's my right. thought process on why we did the moratorium. Right. Right. So can we just focus on that one specific one and do it sooner than later, not versus, six months? Versus like the ADUs and all of that. Correct. Got it. Okay. Is that enough time for you to pull it together, right? Or no? So no, we're talking I can't, I am not pulling together an inclusionary zoning right. regulation in three weeks so right. that you no, can have a public no hearing no. by the end of July. No, we we put a October one. Is that what you're saying? It's got, but, if it's, no, I guess that's my, back to my first question, is do we need till the whole six months until January 2024? No, I said, that. That. Uh, no. I said October no. 1st. I no, we were October 1st. October 1st. Boom. So the March 20 is going to be three months? Yes. The extension okay. would be to October 1st. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought that's what I was starting. Mm -hmm. I led with the election stuff and all that. That's right. Like there was no sense. Having the public There's hearing no sense before sense. October yeah. 1st, having right. everything done by October 1st. Correct. Right. Having at least all the discussions right. in a platform ready. Now, whether or not a hearing continued past October yeah. 1st, but the moratorium would lift by October 1st. Mm -hmm. Got it. But no, we got it. Sorry. Nothing could be done by October 1st. It's got to trickle in after that. I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea okay. what's going well, to come fair. across my desk. Yeah, that's fair. So I'm not saying <clears throat> it can't be. Yeah, okay. I'm saying I have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there could be a so pent up. There could the be, door. you know, so. six developers out there ready to yeah. ready to, to submit. But there also could be. But Nothing. It could be crickets for a month uh, or two. Or I'm sure. I doubt it, I but it's going to be crickets. I don't think it's going to be crickets. Right. Exactly. But I mean, you can't. We can't predict, right. or we can't say with certainty. I guess is a better right. way to put it. So, so I think we need our three months. Because I think for perspective too, so that the commission understands. So, once these are approved and they leave your plate, yeah. right? Oh. They come back around and live mm -hmm. multiple lives with Mr. Sear and I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Multiple lives. Uh, complete with, we have some of the larger housing developments. They're now in, and we're reviewing conservation easements and access easements and final conditions of approval and engineering comments that we put as conditions of approval mm -hmm. that for whatever <laughs> reason are not done <clears throat> to a complete standard. Mm -hmm. or conservation easements are being tinkered with. There's one of the developments. We have reviewed easement documents, and there's four to five easement documents that we're reviewing for a particular development. We've been reviewing the easement documents since February. Because they cannot get it right? Hannah, sorry, there is an I'm inability not. to come to a consensus, and the, the document has been changed from our standard to a point that we don't feel we can agree to it. Wow. <laughs> okay. So that's no, an example just... of like, so you're seeing one lens of this. Right. So 
these things come back and live multiple. And then once we get there, then there's the construction and, mm -hmm. and manganese. And, and that. listen so, to be let's, so I, I just so you understand. No, to be listen, to be clear, I know your office is busy. I'm just trying to get a sense of like maybe it needs to be longer, right? Like, do we need even more time? I just don't okay, know the but time. You're not going to be here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it does, it sense. serves me no purpose because January 1, I'm it, starting I, with trained. a new group. I just, trained. okay. No, I know. So but it just I, doesn't, it doesn't okay. make any sense. Mm -hmm. and, and then at that point, all of your extra free time, you're starting to do campaigning and whatnot. And quite honestly, I don't think any of us need this in the middle of the campaign. Right. Right. This isn't a can. I, this should not be a campaign thing. Yeah. You know? If we don't want it to be a campaign so thing, we have to be done by July then. Well, well that's start, that's right. That's, 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 so when, is, is there a, that's my point. Yeah. Is there the uh, something that's the most bang <laughs> for the buck that would have well, the most the impact time. that we could address in the shortest amount of time? Like, fees in lieu of, or I, I don't know how intensive that would be. Is there something that, you know, you could say is, you know, significant enough that would have some impact, but also wouldn't be a six month endeavor? Is there anything like that? So again, I'd go back to the affordable housing plan, right? So that's the, the platform that we, that's been set. Um, and for me, the, the easiest ones for implementation with the, um, I'll say the least risk, because we have to understand the cost benefit, right? So we need to understand if we go and we do, just like with the moratorium, right? There was an action and there was a reaction, mm -hmm. right? And so we have to be mindful of those actions and reactions. So the lifting the rental for the accessory dwelling units, Quite honestly, they're probably one, there's probably people that have accessory apartments that aren't permitted. Mm -hmm. Two, there's certainly people that have accessory apartments that are probably renting them to somebody that is not a relative or a nanny or, or some other domestic care, right? So do we lift that in that? And we know, you folks know how many accessory apartment regulations we get or, or applications we get, right? Mm -hmm. There's a decent number of them that comes through enough that you all know that term and you know you've all looked at an accessory uh, reg, uh, apartment application. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps with our organic, right? The organic affordability. The detached af affordable, um, I'm sorry, the detached accessory dwelling, I will be completely honest. Staff has been really reserved, not just me, Ms. Bruce has, Garrett has, it's like, this makes us a little edgy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Galvin has put a decent amount of time in it. Mr. Galvin has been incredibly persistent, mm -hmm. articulate, um, enough that I felt it warranted him to come speak with you this evening. Is there probably somewhere a platform for a compromise? Do I think it's appropriate in every single zone? Absolutely not. I think some of our lots are just too small in Farmington and the density is already to a point mm -hmm. where we already have some neighbor constraints because of that or neighbor edginess because of the density that I don't think it's appropriate in every neighborhood uh, in every zone. Is there an ability to start to, do we test the water in the R80, maybe the R40? Maybe. We can look at that and then we can do some research with some of our Again, Krog has already pulled together some of this data, which I need to get the final document. I emailed them. I don't have the final document. When I get it, I will send it out to you. That shows you what our neighboring communities within Krog did. And I say neighboring because it includes Coventry, but it includes Avon. I'm not really sure how they set these boundaries, but <laughs> we're not getting into that. Um, those are easy, but probably with a huge, real big, I don't even know I could get those done. I could get the, the accessory, the in-house accessory apartment, lift the rental. That's easy. We can have that done by July, end of July. The additional detached dwelling unit. Again, I think we need, we need to start looking at Matt. Okay. If we're going to do R80 and R40, what neighborhoods do those? And is it, if it's an R40 cluster, does that count? Cause that's a smaller lot, right? Or is it just straight up R40? Mm -hmm. And it needs to be really specific and the wording of these things really matter. Um, the inclusionary zoning and fee in lieu, 
yes, that's a whole nother level of complexity and additional research that's needed to make sure that as we start to structure this, we start to get some things in place that, that work. And we have to involve our finance director as well, because that fee and lieu program has to come in and the parameters have to, to work um, so that that money, if the fee and lieu is being utilized, has somewhere to go and we know how it's being used. So it's also going to require a change to the town ordinance because right now, the way the ordinance is worded, it's just for new homes. It's not for maintenance, right? And I think we had talked about that the big ticket maintenance items, we want to try to be able to include those. But then again, it's how. So again, if there was a whole nother Shannon, that would have been yeah. done for you folks. Yeah, no doubt. And I know, and I, and no offense is being taken. It's just trying to figure out like, how do we start to peel this uh, and, and get these really unwound enough so that we've got something meaningful to work with? I, I would say for me, if you're looking for prioritization from the commission, I think ADU is a second. I mean, I'm not sure how much that helps the affordability issue. I think, you know, eight permits in all of Fairfield or two in all of New Haven, that's, that's Mr. Galvin gave. I mean, I think inclusionary zoning including the fee in lieu is a really big, could be a really big opportunity for Farmington. And I think if we focus on that as wave one here, and if the new commission has to focus on wave two, like that's how it goes. These people on these commissions sort of come and go as we see here, yeah. uh, even on this specific commission, that that's just my personal take. If we're, if we got to prioritize all those things, that seems like a lot of work and discussion. And even in three months time, right? When one month is already off, so, um, the, I don't know, that's it. I feel like we need to set the roadmap first. Mm -hmm. Like we need to know what all the things are out there and set a roadmap. Otherwise we're just going to be. What, talking about it, bouncing, it. bouncing around. I respectfully disagree. Like, I think the time is now to put something on paper, have those discussions. Then we're rushing into it, Matt, without we, like I don't the full picture. No, but we, we've we heard about inclusionary zoning and we've heard about fee and lieu. Let's have those conversations with the finance director and the housing authority to see what that looks like on paper for our town to just to do. And I think that is the roadmap. Like we have this roadmap from 2021 that you all put together, which I appreciate. So again, that's why I'm just trying to kind of move this along if you want to get this all done in six months. I, okay. So I'm, I too am concerned about affordable housing, but I think my bigger worry is probably more with where you are, Matt, for whatever piece of land that's left. I mean, look at the storage unit and I know we voted for it, but like people are looking at Farmington from other states, looking at opportunities. What can they bring to Farmington because um, we do have some land. I don't know even, I can't even, I know one third is open space. I don't know how much developable land we have, but that worries me a lot. Like what is coming? Is it is it another huge subdivision that we, <clears throat> we already know our roads can support any of it. Um, so I agree. I wish we, I just don't know about the timing of it, Matt. I don't, mm. No, okay. I, and I agree with the the moratorium a, part and, right. and ha, continuing to have that moratorium. So developers, we 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 want to put our new rules in place to prevent right. you know, the developers from coming in. I just think for me, we got to start m moving a little quicker to putting the yes. real things on paper. And I, that's again, I respect the staff's time. To because they're the ones that are going to have to do that. It's easy for me to see here in a second and fourth. Monday of the month to say that, but it, maybe the specific discussions on specific items of the plan, yep. instead of like a larger sort of roadmap with all those pieces Shannon laid out. I think I, I don't, just for me as like a planning part of it would seem challenge challenging. And Matt, when I say a roadmap, all I'm talking about is what the priorities are. So what are we going to work on right now versus what are we going to work on with the next commission? I don't think right. we can start having the conversations by just picking one and jumping in. Well, but we have a moratorium in place, right? So you have eyeballs on our town, right? So we paused for the developers, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are we doing about it? Are we just lifting it saying, all right, we're back to normal or are we taking this opportunity to look at development and smart development? I know these are just words, but 
I we already started the ball by saying, hey, time out. Well, I think we have to come out of the moratorium without with at least one action that was accomplished during the moratorium. Because mm -hmm. that's that's not going to be a good look. Correct. Right. We we said stop all development, but we didn't do anything. Right. You know, so we have to do something. It would it, it would be a missed opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So is is the ADU is that like is that it? Whatever seventy units or whatever we have, I I don't know. I wish we could dig in and do something bigger, like you know, like what Matt was suggesting. Um. Okay. It sounds in general. We're on the right. same page. Right? It sounds in general. There's an appetite yeah. to extend it. Yes. To so October first. I think. Let me get a poll out to see if we can get some work sessions in. Okay. It mm -hmm. sounds like a 6 p.m. start time is okay across the board. So that helps because it's getting us an extra hour without yep. being crazy late. Maybe we'll plan plan agendas for the work sessions to run two hours. This way, if we run to the three, like we're chatty or we're on to something and we go to nine, then it's still not crazy late. Um, understanding that it's an extra meeting mm -hmm. for all of you and y'all got other things to do uh, the next mornings. Um, I don't want to do these start at six and go to 11 for a work session. Mm -hmm. um, I second that. Well, I'd rather do more like a handful of more frequent ones if we yes. can. So we'll see. Um, we'll put it out there and, and see. Um, and then get specific agendas and maybe I can start to put some framework together for what that looks like um, so that we've got a goal like, all right, so if we can, if I can get four or five work sessions in between June, July, and maybe even the first week of August, depending on, you know, whatever folks availability is, like, let's see what we can get and start to put a framework together for what those meetings will accomplish um, so that then when we finish that set, then we can say, okay, we're going to try and staff during the month of August can work on some text amendments, perhaps ideally, and then come into September with something concrete to work with our drafts for folks to look at. Okay. That sounds Let's like roll a, with it. That sounds like a really good plan. Right. I like that idea. Okay. You guys good? All right. Mm -hmm. Well, and okay. if it's more, you know, sometimes it's not, not everyone may be available, but right. if we have a big group, right? No, what I will, I'll, just, so we've got, there's eight of you now. I'm going to, we're not going to hold, I'm not doing a work session if there's not at least half. I'm going right. to say we need yeah, yeah, yeah. half. We need at least right. four out of the eight in attendance. Is that an agreement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. Right. Oh god! And uh, Patrick was in uh, on a on a long break, so <laughs> so he's Patrick is double, yeah. Patrick's been like double duty. Oh, yes, and what yes. we will do, we'll do um we'll zoom we'll do uh the recordings. So okay. if folks aren't here, then they can that catch up. works. Thank you. Yeah. Thank All you, right. Matt, for pushing for the plan. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. Can I ask one quick question, Shannon? And Shannon. Sh no, I'm done. No. I, there's no more. <laughs> No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I heard that. I heard the guy who who, bought, who owned the mill building died. This, yeah, I heard um, that. my husband told Can me we, that right before. Yeah, I we're left. gonna. I'd like to adjourn the meeting, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, we're gonna we, do the yes. minutes and adjourn the meeting. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to motion for um, to approval of minutes, please. May twenty. Make a motion to approve the minutes for the May twenty second, twenty twenty three planning and zoning commission meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We are good. 1050?